Dire Wave. Three. Three. Our anthropology is not derived by human psychology or you know empirical data from MIT or something like this. It's derived from the revealed aspect of, of what we see in Christology. And so there's no real way to diagnose man's problem and to understand man and man's anthropology, as I said, without the, the right theology. Hello. Hey, how are you? Doing well. Excellent. So we are live. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Totally fine. Excellent. I'm an idiot. I had it at seven. It was at nine for me. I was like, I was there at seven. I'm like, what's going on? Uh, and I realized, no, I'm, I, I live in the other direction. <laughs> I, dude, I don't understand time zones. I'm always like, I don't know how, what, who came up with that or how they work. It's like another <laughs> dimension or something. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I really struggle. I always struggle. And, and so it's weird because I have to deal with it all the time, but yeah. I still forget which way it goes. I just tell Jamie to schedule things and then everything gets confused because she's like me. She's no good at scheduling. So <laughs> everything gets all screwed up. But welcome. Uh, we got the man himself, Jonathan Pajot, finally has joined us. He's here, everybody. And I know a lot of people have been waiting a long time for this stream to actually come about. And so I'm really thankful for him uh, to be here to join us. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, he suggested, obviously, the most logical topic which would be to discuss icons and of course Jonathan is uh, an icon carver I will uh, read his uh, bio for you guys if you're not familiar with Jonathan in this audience uh, it says his bio it says he is a professional artist writer public speaker he delivers lectures every year in universities conferences and other venues around North America he speaks on art and especially the symbolic structures that underlie our experience of the world his YouTube channel, of course, and the podcast is Symbolic World. It's linked in the show description for you guys. He also furthers the conversation on symbolism, uh, meaning, and patterns in everything from movies to icons to social trends. Definitely got some overlap there with movies and pop culture. Uh, as an artist, Jonathan is one of the only professional icon carvers in North America. That's fascinating. He takes on institutional and personal art commissions from all over the world. You can view his uh, carving works at the carving website, which I also I believe I linked. And then he is the editor and contributor to Orthodox Arts Journal, which looks at the revival and significance of liturgical art today. He also gives weekly carving, uh, excuse me, week-long carving classes with Hexameron School of Liturgical Arts, which is credited by Pontifex University. And uh, Jonathan, is there anything else you want to add to that bio before we get into it? No, that's the deluxe bio you got there. So that's good. Thanks. Well, I always want to give people the full, you know, like read because when people do my bio, they're always like, yeah, give me something really quick. dude." Uh, so you like talk about movies or whatever, right? <laughs> so it's like, well, I do some other things too, but yeah, I do talk about movies. So, uh, yeah, but it's hard when we have, when we had doing so many things, like you're also yeah. someone who does like all these different things. So when people look at our, our identity, they're like, who is this guy? Like how, what these things don't seem like that they don't fit in neat boxes, let's say. Right. Yeah. And the whole internet world has created for those of us that make our own content, this weird thing where like, if we're talking to our grandparents or to boomers and they're like, what do you do? And then like, well, how do you describe that? <laughs> like uh, I sell myself on the internet. They're like, well, that, that sounds scandalous. No, not in that way. I sell myself in the sense of <laughs> content, right? All right. I need to use that one. Yeah, I, never I sell what to myself. Answer. <laughs> when people ask me, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an artist, but I also do this YouTube thing. Yeah. You know, it's hard to explain. Yeah. I sell myself on the internet. There you go. So let's get into the topic tonight, which is iconography, the reality of symbols, symbolic reality that we did a, a couple podcasts recently on the philosophy of iconography. So I want to get into that with you tonight. And why don't you start with giving us your perspective uh, as you approach orthodoxy, maybe a little bit of background, where you came from when you got into the Orthodox Church, and then what led to you like applying your artistic talents to that domain. And then we'll get into the deep symbolism of, yeah. of, of icons. So I grew up in a Protestant background. My father was a Baptist minister when I was younger. Uh, but converted from Catholicism in Quebec here, you know, it was like the most Catholic place in the world, basically. I think like during World War II, the Vatican had 
secret plans to move to Quebec, you know, if Mussolini won the war. Oh, wow. So, so it's a pretty, it's a, it was a, like the most Catholic place in the world. And then the 60s, there was this massive flip and everybody kind of went crazy, like everywhere else in the world as well. And, but part of the people that kind of left the Catholic church in the 60s and 70s became evangelicals. And that, that was my parents, it was part of them. For them, it was like a real authentic move towards understanding Christ because the Catholic church was quite superficial also in, uh, in Quebec. It was like a, just a cultural Catholicism. Anyway, so I grew up in that in that that milieu, and I was uh, a very artistic from my young age. You know, I thought I was going to do comic books, and I thought I was going to be a painter. And I went to college in fine arts, and really struggled the whole time. Just struggled all through college. I was doing really well; like I had really good grades, and I was doing well in terms of performance. But it was a struggle, like two a double struggle. One was being evangelical and making images because there's like an implicit hostility. It's not explicit, you know? No. I mean, if you ask a Baptist if they think paintings are wrong, they won't say they think that, but don't bring them into church for sure. And also they struggle to kind of explain it theologically, like what role do these objects have in the world? So, so I was struggling with that. And then I was also struggling as a Christian in the contemporary art world, because contemporary art is so cynical. It's so ironic. It's, it's just, you know, commentary upon commentary and this kind of weird, uh, you know, making art about art all the time and mm. this elitism and all that stuff. And so for me, it was like, a, it was such a struggle that my whole artwork, art practice ended up being about that. It was making these images with like the bronze serpent and the Tower of Babel and the problem of images. And it was, it was just kind of convoluted and crazy. Uh, and so it was so funny because my professor that was in charge of me, the last day on my last evaluation, she said, Jonathan, don't worry. You're getting A's, you know, you're doing well, you're fine, but really, what are you doing here? You really don't belong here. You should go to seminary or something. Mm. Uh, and I was cocky, so I just rolled off my back, but, but she was right. She was totally right. And so I, I finished school, got a studio, did the, did the artist thing, got like a post-industrial studio, uh, you know, space with, with friends and painted and did all that. But the crisis just kept growing. And it turned into like a spiritual crisis, I would say, right? It turned into a spiritual crisis where things just weren't connecting in terms of meaning and in terms of my faith. And, in, you know, I just, I started to perceive that it was just this weird narrative of Jesus dying on the cross laid over a materialist substrate. And it just didn't, it just wasn't making sense. And so I started, so I, I destroyed all my art to stop painting and just dropped it, completely abandoned it and started to, to search and reading and reading and reading. And obviously led me into weird corners at first reading kind of uh more, you know, reading things from other traditions, reading things from kind of more kind of esoteric Christianity. And luckily in my kind of wild search, I discovered the church fathers. I discovered uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa. I discovered St. Maximus. I discovered also Vladimir Lossky, who I would say Vladimir Lossky basically converted me. And, um, and obviously with Vladimir Lossky and then with Uspensky, I also discovered the, the, the traditional imagery of the church. And at first it was like discovering kind of medieval imagery in general and just falling in love with this art because I realized that it was really kind of this, it was really like a language. It was more than just mm -hmm. visual images. It was like this internal language, this kind of internal algebra, which was actually similar to scripture. It was yeah. like these patterns, repeating patterns and images that referred to themselves and to each other and kind of point to each other. Uh, and also in the architecture, how certain images are in certain places in the church and how they kind of reflect each other you know like let's say in the apps you have certain images and the western wall you have certain images mm -hmm. and so i really started to see it as like this amazing symphony of images and uh, like I, I just fell in love with it and uh and that's really that so that the, let's say the more theoretical part discovering the saints and discovering especially the mystical part of christianity and then discovering this amazing language of kind of medieval art at first being sad because i thought it didn't exist anymore and then then, re then discovering Uspensky and this kind of rediscovery of the icon and thinking, yes, it does exist. And uh, I need to become Orthodox. So, so that's what led me in 2001 is the first time I, I went into an Orthodox church. And uh, it was during a, um, it was during a Vesperal uh, liturgy. I know it was during a pre-sanctified liturgy in the middle of the week. And, you know, it's like pre-sanctified, it's dark and you're bowing your forehead to the ground and there's candles and, and there's this really kind of, intense uh very uh solemn you know uh liturgy and uh i knew right there that i was going to become orthodox that was just a question of time you know just that first time in the church 
Um, and so then slowly, you know, I, I, I started to, I wanted to paint icons actually. That's what I wanted to do. But at that time in like 2000, in 2000, 2001, 2002, there weren't any teachers. You just, it was really, people were really struggling to find teachers. And I knew it's something, the painting is very complicated. It's, it's, uh, it's very technical. And so I knew that I couldn't improvise the painting because it was like egg, you have to learn how to make egg, egg paint and all the gilding and you know all these layers and stuff i was from contemporary art like i had no technical skills whatsoever and uh and so my parents cut down a tree in their yard and they said jonathan do you want some of this wood supposedly you can carve it it was linden tree and i thought ah, i'm gonna make a blessing cross like i was just super hyped i had no tools i had exacto knives like carved this whole cross with exacto knives <laughs> like, like like the actual shape of the cross i carved with exacto knives which is really embarrassing to think about now uh, and I showed it to the priest at the church where I was going. I was still a catechumen. And he was like, you know, oh, this, yeah, this is okay. You should, you should keep going. And, uh, and then I did, and I kept going. And, you know, there's a lot more to the story. But finally, uh, many years later, my bishop gave me a commission for a panagia, for a, 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 um, for a, a pendant, and then a cross. And I asked him, I said, if I, if I do this commission, to me, this means that this is like a blessing to me for me, for me to do this. And he said, of course. And, uh, and then I'll be honest, from then on, I never stopped. Like I just always had commissions and I've been carving now full time since 2011, pretty much. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, there's some parallels there that I can recall in my journey as well, where I know when I was in the Protestant world, one thing that always sort of entranced me was the symbolism that I would see in the arts. So I would, I would see symbolism in film and literature. And then when you take college classes, you do these readings of the text and so forth. And then I realized that, you know, this was everywhere in scripture. And then when I would go to church, I was at, at that time in a pretty hardcore Calvinist church that was very kind of iconoclastic. And there was like, there's, yeah, there's a symbolism everywhere out there and everything, but God doesn't like it, basically. <laughs> and that's what I, yeah, exactly. and I would get into these arguments with my Protestant pastor because I'd be like, well, but don't you think even in the New Testament, there's, you know, Paul talks about tupos, typology, and don't you, th and he was like, no, 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 you can only talk about symbols when it's specifically stated in the New Testament or some weird rule that he had. And yeah. I remember that was kind of when I was starting to think, maybe I need to look at, you know, church fathers or outside of the realm of Protestantism. And at that time, I didn't know about orthodoxy. I just kind of drifted towards uh, the Roman Catholic world. But my question would be there. Uh, I like that you said the 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 scripture is really kind of a, a, a lexicon of symbols in yeah. a way. And one thing, I, uh, when I was Roman Catholic, I read John St. John Damascus and his defense of icons. And I remember him kind of presenting iconography like another way to read everything, right? So in other words, reality is kind of like a, an iconographic text that we read. Our experiences, we read them, we interpret them. The Bible is a book we read and, and interpret. And icons, do we do the same thing. So at, at that stage, you know, when I was coming into the Roman Catholic world, I just thought, oh, well, icons are just, uh, you know, a neat thing that's like maybe another form of religious art, right? But I think there's something significant that I didn't know that, that, you know, eventually as you get into Orthodox, you kind of learn. But before we get into the significance and, and distinct set apart nature of iconography, um, could you go into maybe your take on how you see what John Damascus calls like an iconographic representation <clears throat> of the world, the way that we can we can see the world as kind of a, a well, I forget the word you use, but like a network of symbols or something like that? Yeah, I think that you know, we, we realize, I think it's, it's, we're in a good moment right now in terms of even secular people, like they, they can kind of understand the problem of multiplicity, right? The problem of, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, this kind of explosion of detail that everything is too complicated. If you, if you, if you don't have patterns that organize reality, right, then, then everything has a million of details and it's like indefinite amount of details. And so what you realize is that even our just basic perception of the world is always patterned. It's always, it, it's, it's teleological, right? You're always judging something, whether it's a good, whatever it is you're looking at, and that lays itself out in a, in a hierarchy. And that's what I think is going on in scripture and in icons. That is, it's a condensed form of your everyday experience. It's kind of like a map or like the most condensed version of something that you can actually experience every day. Uh, and so, so I think that like, for example, like the, the, if you read, look at the text in Genesis, you really have this amazingly condensed, like the, one of the most condensed stories that has ever, probably the most condensed story that's ever, be, ever existed and just lays out this image of reality 
this lineage of heaven above and below, and then this hierarchy of this ontological hierarchy, uh, and you know the problem of going down the ontological hierarchy, and the possibility of of let's say being up in the garden. All of these all of these things are actually related to our experience of the world. And then icons they do it in a visual way. It, it's uh, it's not in time, but it's in space. And so in icons you can actually do things that you can't totally do in scripture because it's in, it's simultaneous. Yeah. So you have this kind of simultaneous experience of a, of a space that's laid out exactly like in Genesis. So you have above, you have below, and it's very graphic in, uh, in an icon compared to like, a, let's say a Baroque image where the perspective can be from anywhere, if it can be from underneath or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's all this idiosyncrasy in an icon. You have, you have the top part, which is heaven, the bottom part, which is earth. And then, inside that things will be laid out in a in a in an ontological hierarchy so you won't have the hand of god coming from below that'd be stupid i mean it's so intuitive it's so intuitively right that we don't even question it but nonetheless that's how the, the that's how the the icon will present itself the glory of god will appear above or the hand of god will appear above and then the things that are at the bottom you'll have this cracked earth often with like openings into the darkness at the bottom of icons to kind of show you this cosmic image, you know, even in the, the, even in an icon, that's not talking about that. It will still have mm -hmm. that pattern, that pattern within it. Yeah. That makes me think of, um, approximations in scripture. There's, there's, like you said, not an exact, uh, one-to-one -one because of usually scripture, if it's not like a, a poetic text or a prophetic text, it's presenting things in a, you know, linear storytelling model. Uh, and, but if you look at apocalypse 12, you have that excellent example of, with Mary, she's also an image of Israel. She's also an image of the church. And she's also an image of the historical battle of the serpent with the people of God. So you have basically all of time and space, you know, squished into this image of Mary as queen of heaven. And I think uh, it just made me think of that when you were talking about how it's kind of pre presenting a series of patterns condensed into one event. I remember when I was Protestant uh, or coming into it to uh, back in the, the 2000s into Roman Catholicism, I was, I was having a problem with this. And I was thinking how as a Protestant could I, could I convey what I'm understanding to, you know, people. And I thought, uh, well, if you, if you think about the, the way that the Bible for a Protestant is, is called the Holy Bible, right? I mean, it's like, it, it has this notion of it being set apart as a special book and, but and then when you try to like uh, explain iconography to people who who are reticent to go down that route, if you think about when you read Luke one and two, the story of the of the, of the Annunciation, and you're you're getting this kind of image in your head. I'm not saying that we should, you know, come up with imaginary images. I'm just saying that you, it's kind of unavoidable as a human when yeah. you read the text. You kind of get this story in your head, and then when you look at the icon of the Annunciation you're looking at a, like you said, like a single encapsulated image that's telling you the whole presentation of Luke 1 and 2 about the, you know, the birth or the, the message of the incarnation of our Savior. So yeah. it really clicked with me one day where it was like, you know, if you can, if we can convey that to the Protestant, then, and that's a huge hang up, you know, for so many Protestants is this idea of images. If we can convey the fact that it's really not doing anything different than what scripture is doing. It's just doing it in a different medium in a different yeah. form and it's creating different it does end up creating different possible different possible insights into the mystery of christ that scripture doesn't do exactly in the same way yeah. you know you look at an image of the crucifixion or uh, uh, one of the best versions one of the best images to kind of understand this is an image of the ascension for example so you have this image of the ascension you have christ up above you know being brought up by the merkaba he actually has wheels underneath mm -hmm. it and so that's not in the text right that's not in the text but the icon is connecting you saying, you know, those times where Elijah went up, you know, where the, the, this chariot that mm -hmm. Ezekiel saw, yeah. it's like, this is, this is related to this ascension, mm -hmm. you know? And so you have Christ going up into the heavens. And then at the bottom, you have in the center, you have the mother of God often standing on a, on a pedestal, which is interesting. So it's like Christ, the heaven is his throne and the earth is his pedestal. Right. And so the mother of God in the center, and then the disciples all gathered around. And then you look at the icon and you're like, well, why is St. Paul there? Because St. Paul was there, wasn't there at the Ascension in right. Scripture, right? Good point. But he's there because it's that concentration. It's like that possibility of saying, this is an event that happened. It's an image of an event that happened, but we're going to show it to you in a way that is actually revealing the mystery of the church itself and the, the cosmic mystery of what Christ is doing. Yeah. And, and, it's a, and it becomes an image of both the Ascension 
and the and the last moment and the return of Christ at the same time. This is something that is hard to do in a text, but in an image, yeah. you can create these these cosmic maps that are just uh, astounding when you start to think about it. That's a great point. There was a, a, a one of the uh, debates that was that was had at the Moscow Icon Synods. Somebody was discussing how uh, icons can tell us things outside of time and space. They can tell us things in that higher dimension because, and he, he used an example. I, th- I want to say it was an example of some of the icons that present other people at at Pentecost who weren't actually yeah. present at Pentecost. Yeah, so, the same thing as, yeah. as Ascension. St. Paul is there and the evangelists yeah. are there. and yeah, That's a great point because one thing that really struck me when I got into Orthodox theology was that the mysteries and the, the theology is being presented in time and space, but also above time and space. And so even the, um, the perspective, the perspectivalism of icons is intended to, to give you that window into heaven so that you're outside of just the here and the now. So just like Christ's cross, uh, as St. Maximus says, the benefits can be applied before and mm. after the actual event, the same idea is going on with iconography where we're actually looking into the eternal realities. And so there are windows into heaven. And, and I wanted to get into the Neoplatonic stuff as well, if, if you're okay going in that direction. Sure. Yeah. Because yeah. I think Neoplatonism has both pros and cons in this side of, uh, of iconography. Because on the one hand, you've got a, a, a type prototype relationship of the patterns that relate back to their, their archetype. And then you've also got a misuse of Neoplatonism uh, when you get into the icon councils, I mean, excuse me, the iconoclast, because they were trying to say there's nothing significant about an icon. Everything is just an icon of the ideas. And so there's two extremes that we can go. We can do like the Protestant, you know, extreme, the iconoclast extreme. Uh, And then there's, I think, the middle position, the balanced position of orthodoxy, where we, uh, as St. Gregory Palma says, we're actually affirming it's not an either or dialectic between history versus the, the uh, supra historical. It's a both and because Christ yeah. is supra historical. He transcends, he's transcendent, but he's also imminent and he also came into time and space. And there's also all of these problems end up being solved by, by hierarchy in general. That is, there are concentrations. You can, like, I always imagine that this pattern like a mountain, right? It's like as you go up the mountain, there's like a concentration of reality towards that space where heaven and earth meet. And let's say the higher you go, the more liturgical the world becomes, the more pattern, the more like a, a poem or like a, or like an icon the world becomes. And it doesn't mean that at the bottom of the mountain, God isn't manifesting himself also. Right. But there is a reality in which even though you can bring, let's say, the, the power of the liturgy into your everyday life, into your everyday life, there is nonetheless a hierarchy in which it kind of flows through that, right? It's like, for you to be able to kind of see God in uh, in like taking your cup of coffee, you know, you also have to you have to be connected through the sacraments and through this this more concentrated version of reality for things to kind of lay themselves out properly. And so that the kind of argument where it's like, you know, I can pray to God on the toilet, you know, no problem. Like I can talk to God anywhere. And that kind of that kind of reduction of of reality is like you said, it is it, it's almost like a, a kind of not like a kind of subtle Gnosticism where there isn't this idea that that the forms, the the, rea- the forms in the world, not the forms, but let's say the the, the actual particulars in the world, mm-hmm. they actually do manifest God at their level of reality, like Saint Maximus tells us. Like mm-hmm. they just kind of embody di- different aspects of God at, to their capacity, let's say. And the, the the icons, the sacraments, and the liturgy are just more concentrated and more kind of uh, are closer to the top of the mountain, let's say. Yeah, that's that that's that great analogy of. Uh you know, the, the, the life of Moses and going up the mountain yep. that we see in the Cappadocians. I mean, um, one thing that, that I would ask, I want to get your take on, because this comes up a lot when, if we're talking to uh, Roman Catholic friends or, or, or people who are in that uh, line of thinking, which I used to, to be in, and I would think, well, look, uh, you know, Orthodox and Catholicism don't really differ on this because we all believe in religious art and we all believe in religious imagery. And my take would be that, well, we do have actually a difference in regard to uh, the Seventh Ecumenical Council because we see iconography, at least in my understanding, we see it as 
not just religious art. It's actually another class of things that's particular to the liturgy. And I'm not trying to be overly rigorous. I know there's some flexibility in the liturgy and, you know, Russian styles of icons versus Greek styles of icons. I'm aware of that. But there is, I think, a marked difference between, um, say, Renaissance style art, which I think we can appreciate. I just did a, a interview with my priest who's a specialist in Renaissance art. So I I have no problem with a, with an appreciation for Renaissance art style, but there's definitely definitely a different uh, norm and practice that we see in the Orthodox world, you know, liturgically speaking, as opposed to what we see in the Sistine Chapel. So even though yeah. we can appreciate it, um, could you speak to how 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 would you explain to somebody who thinks that, well, what's the difference? Who cares if it's an icon or the Sistine Chapel? It all means the same thing. Or do you yeah. think? Do you think there's a significance of the difference? There's definitely a, there's a, de there's a very significant difference. One of the things we see that happens is that after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the images that we use become, become, they appear, they appear pretty fast, actually. You know, they, so, they were based on prototypes that existed before. And so you do find threads of many of the images that we, find, we see today in pre- uh, pre Seventh Ecumenical Council art that you see in Rome and you see in different areas, but after the Council, you really see this kind of formalization of the image. And what's going on is really a. It's like we realize what the role of the image is. Like we we actually kind of gave ourselves a frame for it, you know, because it was a little maybe unclear before. We gave ourselves a frame, and now we made those images as theological as possible. They were just refined mm. in their into their most theological form. And so what happens is that there's always flexibility. The orthodoxy is not like a, it's not like a military operation. There's, there's always a place where it's a, the more rigorous tradition and the flexibility of the milieu, the flexibility of the, uh, even of the artist will appear, but there nonetheless has to be certain things which are unsaid that have to be respected. And that just comes from getting the mind of the, of the church, right? As, as Once you're in the world and you start to look at icons and look at icons and look at icons and have someone to teach you or you, 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 you read or you, you start to see what is essential and what is idiosyncratic. Um, but those essential things are very essential. And what you're doing when you're participating in that is it's almost, it's almost liturgical, even in a priestly sense. That is that for the liturgy to exist, like you said, there is a little bit of variability, but there are some things which really need to be there mm -hmm. for it to be an effective liturgy. And there's the same thing with icons. There's certain elements which really need to be there for it to be, for it to be, let's say, canonical or to participate in the liturgical life of the church. Um, and so, and so, I think that that's something that even you can see that even as the orthodox church went towards western art and it did you know in the in the 18th 17th 18th 19th century nonetheless you can look at a lot most of those images and the elements let's say the iconograph iconological elements they still had to put them in there because they they instinctively knew mm -hmm. that if you don't have let's say you know the skull of adam you know, in the, in the in the image of the crucifixion, if you don't have certain things, certain basic things, if you don't have Christ in the cave, if you do, for the nativity, if you don't have certain basic elements, then you are definitely someone's going to rip your icon off the wall. Like the people are actually going to become aggressive and mm. are going to want to to mm -hmm. destroy these these images. Uh, whereas in the the Catholic Church, you know, uh, Pope Benedict said that the, that the Catholic Church never fully accepted the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Right. right. And I think that that's true. And what it and what you can see is that although all, all that say all the way up to the 13th century, you have an iconographic sense and and a rich iconographic sense. But you can see more variability, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then that more variability, which was OK at the beginning, starts to then break down into idiosyncrasy and, you know, little dogs at the at the at the, the at, in the front of paintings and, you know, wanting to show all these kind of more sensual images and you know, just this, just, just, just a breakdown of theology in the image where theology becomes secondary to yep. the, to the effect. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's, that summarizes it perfectly that in the Roman mindset is the theology is subordinated to the practical usage of the usages of the enemy or the enemy, the, <laughs> the enemy. imagery, excuse me. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Roman Catholics. I'm not calling you guys. It was an accident. It was a slip of the tongue, right? They're going to say Freudian slip, expose yeah, it, yeah. clip it. Right. Um, no, but so the, uh, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned at the beginning too the the Ospensky Losky book, Theology of the Icon, because that volume two is great for uh, going into the history of the the 
icon discussions and debates and councils, you know, after the seventh council. And there's, there's a great uh, chapter on Palamas in there where, you know, before I looked at Orthodox theology, I'd never thought about that saints have a golden halo for a reason. <laughs> like mm-hmm. It's not just because they're like an angel or something. You know, I think like when I was Protestant or Catholic, I was like, oh, that's just like showing that they're like heavenly or whatever, dude. No, it's actually teaching the Palamite uh, doctrine of the uncreated energies that the saints actually possess and participate in the uncreated light. And that's what that, you know, golden halo actually signifies. And then you look at when you look at the icon of Christ, right, and you see him with the I am, right, that's the Greek letters that Christ wears in, in at least the Byzantine icon of Christ. And so I started really, oh, so this is the, so the icon has to teach right theology. And that was like a yeah. big thing that went off in my head. Like, you can't just do anything in an icon because you want to convey the right theology, the right meaning. And so that's what's so key here is that it's not so much about the, I think the way St. Jerome spoke of scripture, he said, it's not so much a matter of the of the words that is as it is the meaning, right? What are we conveying in this? That's the key point here. So uh, maybe there's flexibility in the, in the means or the, the, the uh, medium itself, but the meaning is what's key. And I think that yeah. you, you talk about that quite a bit. And one of the things that actually, I think one of the things that helped preserve the meaning in the Orthodox Church was also the fact that the icons are like, a, I hate the word system, but let's say, they're like a full language, right? So like the images aren't independent from each other. The images are all talking to each other. And so because of that, it also becomes complicated to, to let's say, affect one image because there's like a whole underlying language which makes all these images uh, like talk to each other, like I said. And so, you know, and so let's say you have, let's say the image of Christ in glory, you know, you have him in the dome as, you know, the Pantocrator as the one returning at the end of time, but then you'll also see him in the iconostasis as Christ in the center with the, as a, with the mother of God and St. John on, on the side. And then you'll see it in the last judgment, you'll see it in the ascension. And so this image of Christ in glory becomes, you know, is, is moved from in different, into different icons to show different aspects of the mystery. And that's true for a lot of elements. And so because of that, it, I think it's one of the things that kind of held the language much longer because people realize that this isn't just like, I'm just not, I'm not just making like some image of the, you know, the transfiguration because I, you know, I like to and because the church asked me to. It's, it's, it's that that image of the transfiguration in the icons of the feast has to be standing next to the other images of the feast. And there has to be a kind of theological and imagistic coherence among all these images. Uh, and the fact that the, the images were also in the church, whereas in the West, there was less of that, especially after the after the Gothic period, there was less and less painting on the walls and more and more, you know, just kind of paintings hung up in the church. Uh, and that I think that also transformed the, this this kind of sense of of, a, of an entire sacred space that has all these images referring to each other. One thing that comes to mind there is the the notion of sacred space and that sacred space is supposed to, uh, there's, there's a good book by uh, uh, Marquilla Iliada on the, the sacred and the profane. And he talks about uh, the sacred space and it being outside of time and space. And, and I think that the temple and the temple's imagery and the, the imagery of the Ark of the Covenant and the imagery of the tabernacle, all of that was, you know, uh, preparing the way for what we have in reality, you know, in our temples and our churches. And so uh, I know you've, you've commented on in the past, uh, as well as we have on this channel, uh, St. Maximus' mystagogy of the church. Um, how does that play into that? How does the, the whole space of the church play into this in relationship to the icons? Well, the, if you look at, like, if you look at the, at the image of the church, let's say the most traditional version of the, of the Orthodox church with the dome and with an apse, and then with a square or a cross at the, at the bottom, you really have an image of the, of the ascension itself. It's, a, it's an image, the early images of Christ up in the dome were actually images of the ascension. Uh, and then you'd have the disciples below that were kind of like the earth that was looking up towards heaven and seeing Christ uh, above. And so, I think that you can see that the church is a is a is a microcosm. It, it's a yeah. it's one version of the let's say human being is the microcosm, but it's like one higher version of that microcosm is the actual church itself because it has a square at the bottom, which is the earth or the New Jerusalem, you know, all these or the or the tabernacle or the uh, you know the the um not the tabernacle but the uh, the 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 uh, 
Ark of the Covenant, which was also this box. So it's like receiving the glory of God below. And then above you have the, the dome of heaven, the rainbow. You, know, you see Christ sit, sitting on a rainbow in, in, in some of the early icons. It's like this, this round part. And so, and so the, the church becomes really like an image of the entire cosmos itself. And then the icons within that, within that space will then reflect their different place in, in the, so like you wouldn't have an image of the Dormition in the dome of the church, right? You put an image of the Dormition on the Western wall right. because it represents the end of the liturgical year because it represents the mysterious end of, of the life of the Virgin, you know, this death that is going to move towards resurrection, but it still has to be recognized as this last moment or the last judgment on the Western wall, for example. These two images are there because the Western wall has a reality in the liturgical space, you know, this image of, uh, this image of Christ, you know, coming like a lightning bolt from the East to the West, you know, this kind of imagery of moving from the beginning to the end. Well, the church has that, that shape itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the, in the East, you'll have the Panagia, you'll have the, the rising of the sun, you could say with the Christ coming out of the, of the Virgin. And then in the West, then you have the end of that process, which is the death of the Virgin or the last judgment. So those are little little images of how the church participates in this, in the in the kind of uh, cosmic image. But you know, it's, there are so many. Everything about the way the icons are placed will have that uh, will kind of have that same shape. Let's say. Oh yeah, that's great. Uh, one thing too that struck me uh, reading Saint Maximus, which I'm sure you would resonate with, and I want to get your comment on this, is Maximus has a very positive view of nature. Uh, he, he, the natural world. And so he sees the natural world as in fact, one of the embodiments of the logos. And he speaks of, you know, three different embodiments. He speaks of the embodiment of the logos in the Virgin, the embodiment in the, uh, uh, humanity that he, that he took in the Virgin. And then he speaks the, of the embodiment in the church and in nature, in the sense of, he, he calls it a veil that the logos wears. Mm. And I, and I'm curious, how, is there a relationship between iconography and, and the natural world in the sense that do does the, is there a, a regularity to the way iconography presents animals, trees, life basically in the yeah. natural world? Well, many of the many icons they they represent uh, the desert. Like most of I say most of the icons they tend to represent the world as the desert. And so oh, you can see yeah. th then there's something of the wilderness, let's say. So okay. there's something of monastic, uh, very monastic about, you know, how the iconographic tradition got developed. So that's why you'll see, always see behind Christ, these cracked earth, these, these kind of cracked earth mountains. And you see often cracks at the bottom of the, of the world, you know, with, uh, with, with holes where sometimes you can see darkness at the, at the bottom. And so usually it's seen as, uh, as, as wilderness. And so it's, so there's this ascetical, there's more of an ascetical vision in, let's say, the way that the iconog iconographical tradition got uh, transmitted. But there are other ways to see what St. Maximus talked about, which I see it has to do with ornamentation. Mm. So in a, in a church, what you'll have is you'll have images, but then also on the, between the images, you'll have foliage, you'll have uh, you know, foliage with animals in them and all this kind of a natural space. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get that hierarchy of revelation in the very structure of how images present themselves. Like if you look at a medieval manuscript, like a, even a Western medieval manuscript, you really get that, that structure where you have the image in the center. And then on the outskirts of the image, you'll have foliage. You'll have all these, these, these ornaments that are made of leaves and have animals in them and sometimes even have monsters and, you know, and uh, gargoyle type creatures. And mm -hmm. so there is this idea of this, this kind of basic cosmic image of everything, of everything kind of participating in this, in this pattern, even up to the end of the world, you could say. Um, and so I think that that's probably the best way to see it. And, but in icons, really, we've developed this more of an aesthetic image. So the trees are very sparse, you know, there's huh. a, there's kind of like a, there's more of a desert imagery. If you look at the icons, you'll start to notice it if you haven't noticed it before, that that tends to be the, the way mm -hmm. that the, the tradition developed. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, this life being that passage through the desert wandering to, you know, the, the eschaton being, you know, the promised land. Um, I wanted to ask too about uh, 
the, the you, you mentioned the we were talking about Neoplatonism earlier, and you know when I first met you, we had we had heard a lecture about uh, the the um, Neoplatonic idea, the Plotinian idea of this sort of journey that goes on from um, creatures that go that sort of go out from God, and then they go through a process, a cycle, and they come back to God. Yeah. Even the pagans seem to have had a notion, as we know from like the Orphic mysteries and this kind of stuff, of nature goes through this sort of cycle, right? Yeah. Of, of birth, death, resurrection. And then we have a cycle, obviously, in the church as well, where we, we have the liturgical cycle. And I've always just found it uh, uh, amazing, if we think about it, that the whole purpose of the liturgical cycle is actually a commentary, in a way, on nature, the, the, the cycle of the natural world. It's like... Yeah. The real meaning of the natural world is this stuff, is the the liturgical cycle. Would, would you would you agree with that? I totally agree. And I think that it's actually a key that a lot of people want to dismiss because they're afraid that they are paganism. So a lot of people, if you point to them, right? So you, you've heard that argument before, right? It's like, oh, yeah. the nativity of Christ is just, it's just a solstice, you know, that the Christians oh, yeah, try right, to take right. over, all that kind of yeah. kind of nonsense. But I think that we can we can actually flip that back on yes, it because agreed. I do believe it is about the solstice. But what it's doing, it's actually revealing yeah. the cosmic mystery of the solstice in the incarnation of Christ exactly. in the darkness of the cave. This hidden mystery, which is not yet completely revealed in the in the lowest place, you know, in the manger, in the place where the animals eat, like the lowest part of the world, mm -hmm. and then will start to reveal himself, you know, as the year kind of moves on, and so. Like to me, that's not a problem at all. And of course, right. I mean, you know, the, the the fact that we have the dormition at the fall, all of these things make complete sense in terms of just the natural cycle of things. But right. like you said, it's not people see it in the upside down way. They think that, oh, it's just Christians trying to take over these these pagan holidays. And not these pagan holidays. These are just natural cycles that God created. Yeah. And Christians are now trying to reorient them towards their ultimate meaning. And 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 even if they do use, and I don't even have a problem. To, to the extent that sometimes Christian actually took some of the pagan elements mm -hmm. and then redirected them towards their fullness of meaning sure. either. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all because it, you know, the, if you tell me that Christmas isn't about celebrating the nativity of Christ, then you're just, it's, this is, it's bull. Like that's what it, that's what, that's what we celebrate. And, and if there are some, you know, like some, like say the Christmas tree, like it's some people say, oh, this is an old pagan tradition, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. It's like, okay, fine. But when I look at a Christmas tree, it's like, I don't know, I see a star up there and I see all these lights going down and then I see Christ below in the manger and I'm like, I know, that's a, pre that's a pretty good pattern. I don't actually don't have a problem with it at all. Yeah, this is a, a, a kind of a basic problem that we always address on this channel because uh, a lot of the you know evangelical crowd, they, they get upset about that kind of stuff. And if you use this or that symbol, oh, then it, symbols only have one meaning and they always mean yeah. this occult thing. No, no, no. Symbols have a lot of different meaning. And the, and the example we always give is, look, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, Satan is the lion who goes about seeking human made to devour. So a lion can have different reference in different senses, different contexts. And so in the same way, a lot of symbols actually work this way. So we can't have like a, you know, isomorphic single sense to which symbols always only mean this thing. Another good example of this that, that you touched on a minute ago is the microcosm, macrocosm element. This is something that it's, probably debated i would say as to the actual origins of this because on the one hand we could say well now wait a minute this is a an esoteric alchemical neoplatonic thing well yeah the neoplatonists talk about man as a micro uh, a microcosm of the macrocosm but paul speaks of christ as the <laughs> microcosm right. of the macrocosm so it really doesn't matter who's using the argument or where it comes from if it's true it doesn't matter. Right. And so we can appropriate those things. We can. And in fact, some scholars even argue that that idea was actually in uh, Jewish theology prior to Paul. It was already there that, you know, Israel is a kind of a body of God. There's a whole yeah. uh, tradition in, in Jewish theology of, of Israel being the bride and body of God and this kind of stuff. So there's fluidity in these uh, these ideas that we don't have to have this rigid notion that if a, a pagan philosopher says this, then it must have come from him and it must have come from demons. Now, <laughs> that, you know, that's a silly kind of idea approach to these things, because, again, even St. Paul, right, in his epistles, he calls uh, you know, Christ, the new Adam. And by being the new Adam, he encapsulates as a divine hypostasis with a human, human nature. He encapsulates not just all of human nature, but according to Romans eight, 
cosmic scope of all reality. And so St. Maximus can go so far as to say that Christ not only reconciles all of uh, dis- dispersed, discrete human nature that was fragmented from the fall, but he says all of cosmic reality yeah. is restored in the incarnation. Yeah, and St. Maximus goes, St. Maximus, like people really just have to read him because, I mean, he really talks about how the entire cosmos is meant to be divinized. Like it's not exactly. even just man, like right. through man, yes, but ultimately all of creation is is headed toward divinization that's the that's the reason why it was created in the first place basically right. and so i totally agree with you and i think that that's to me and i think like you said i think what it is it's a weird thing like because you see it in orthodox circles too it's like orthodox orthodox people that kind of converted from protestantism and were very anti-catholic mm-hmm. and so saw a lot of like weird or interpreted a lot of catholic things as weirdly esoteric then they become orthodox and they keep doing that but it's like you have a lot of stuff that if you keep doing that, you're going to run into major problems. Like when you see your bishop with a staff that has two snakes on it, you're going <laughs> to run into a major bring, problem, my friend, <laughs> because it's like it's like you, you have to drop that type of thinking and rather see the image for what it is in its context and how, you know, how it can be, how it can be, even if it was taken from some pagan source, it can be reoriented because yeah. Christ redeems. You know, but it has to be reoriented, obviously. Like you're not going to have heavy metal music playing in a in an Orthodox church because it just, you know, it, it's not it, it's not reoriented in the proper the proper way or in the proper hierarchy. But some things have been, and that's completely fine. Like the image of, uh, let's say, a domed building, uh, you know, that came from Roman, it came yeah, from Roman architecture. Right. But it's an but like who? Why would you deny that? It's an amazing image. It's a it's a powerful image that is completely coherent with biblical symbolism and the biblical way of describing reality and so it's like why would you why would you throw it away if you can now reorient it towards christ yeah it would be like saying uh uh muslims had steeples aka minarets before protestants and so if you're a protestant you're getting your steeple from a muslim i'm just joking but yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, no, it, I, I exactly you play the saying. genetic fallacy there where it has nothing to do with whether it's true or false but yeah. um so uh let's see you did bring up something there i wanted to ask you about um oh so i remember one of the first things i read from you and i did i don't think i realized at the time when i'd read it that that was you and i it was uh, i believe an essay that you had done it was an excellent essay by the way on that very thing the 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 double-headed snake on the staff um could you maybe go into that because i actually get not not a lot, but every now and then I get you know a, a Protestants who say, "What is this? This looks esoteric, it looks occultic," and it's like, "No, no, no! You have to understand the context, the symbolism." I mean, do you think that the bronze serpent on a pole was was occultic? No, exactly. it's, it's, it's in Numbers, it's in John three. So, could you could you go into some of that because your essay was really good on that? Yeah, well, it ha- it's a very it has to do with revealing it reveals very much a mystery of of Christ, like, very much so. That is, it's not just about even understanding. The, the staff of the of the bishop of the two servants is understanding first of all the serpentine shape that Christ has on the cross itself you know and that you can understand it superficially as saying okay he's the bronze serpent you know but this is this is there's a there's an even deeper mystery to that which is the snake in the garden you know there are different ways of understanding the snake in the garden obviously you know you can say it's satan you can say but a good way i think of understanding it which makes sense in kind of orthodox anthropology is to understand this the the snake as the purveyor of death that the one who's bringing death you know because he's lying about the nature of reality and he's going to bring humans into fragmentation and dispersion um and uh, and so, and so it's death, it's change as well, right? Change in the negative sense, change in the sense that here you're in the, you're in the proper state and now we're going to change you back into the lower state. Uh, but what Christ does is he reverses that process, right? He uses death against death, you mm. could say, right? He dies to restore life. And so because of that, the, the idea that Christ becomes the serpent on the staff, Moses already did that. Moses already took the dead, these things that are bringing death at the bottom of the world. So you have all these slithering things that are the passions, that are all of these these fragmentation of the world at the bottom that are that are stinging you, and and you and you're dying because of that. And so Moses takes that like medicine, right? Medicine is a, is made out of the poison, or is made out of the disease, or made out of the let's say a cure. Um, cure is made out of the po- of the poison, right? Mm-hmm. So he takes one, he lifts it up on the on the on the the stick, like on the puts it up on the top of the hierarchy 
And if you look to that, then all of a sudden that ends up curing your death. And it's like an image of Christ, what Christ is going to do. Christ is going to do exactly that. He's going to turn death against itself. And he's going to, so when you look at the image of the, the staff of the bishop, that's what you're getting. It's, it's actually really related to the, to the, to the image of, of, of Asclepius, right? It is related to that in terms mm-hmm. of meaning. Mm-hmm. That is, you have, there's a, there's a tradition according to which um, uh, the Asclepius, what he did is that he, he, he cut the Gorgon in half. But he didn't cut it in half. He would take blood from the right side of the Gorgon in order to heal people, you know, implying that blood from the left side of the Gorgon would be poisonous, right? So you have, from one side, you have the raising up, and then one side, you have the pushing down. And so that's the way to kind of understand these two snakes on the side of the bishop's staff, which is the, the good thief, the bad thief, right? The one that goes up, the one that goes down, the two possibilities of change, you could say. One which is using change to bring you up towards God, and one which is the manifestation of, of change which brings you down into death. And so it's actually very, it's very much coherent with, so a, another way it was represented in, in uh, medieval art was that you would have Christ on the cross, kind of S-shape, and then you have the serpent at the bottom of the cross coming up to bite him on the, like coming to bite his heel. Hmm. And so you would have the two snakes on the cross as being these two aspects of death, one which is bringing you towards life and one which is trying to pull you down towards towards uh, towards death itself. Uh, and so those two serpents end up being a similar a similar version of that same that same structure, let's say. Interesting. Uh, yeah. What are some other um, maybe mi- t- top f- if you could think of a few <laughs> misinterpreted symbols? Like what are some of the things that you think most people get really wrong or have totally, you know, overlooked or, or what, what are, yeah. the, you know, the, if you want to. Well, the, the one those. that I've seen online all the time is when they see uh, an image of the Pope wearing a cross with a skull on it. And then people freak out. They're like, oh, he's, you know, he's a Satanist because he has a skull on his cross. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's one of the major misunderstood, uh, misunderstood symbols, because that that's an, that's one of the oldest uh, traditions of how to represent the crucifixion, which mm-hmm. is that. You represent Christ uh, on the cross, and then you represent the skull of Adam at the bottom. It's actually similar to what I, I said before. So you have the death of Adam at the bottom of the cross. Then you have the death of Christ at the top of the cross, which is actually restoring the death of Adam. And then you see the blood of Christ going dripping down onto the mm. skull of Adam in this like cave. Uh, and so often people are confused about seeing why is there a skull you know, in the crucifixion, especially like if it's on a, on a, on a cross on someone. Like they just see the skull at the bottom of the cross and they freak out and they wonder what it is. But it really is, it really is representing the mystery of the, of really the mystery of the crucifixion, which is hard to, you know, it's like, we're so used to seeing Jesus on the cross that we, we, we just kind of dismiss it. But man, what's going on there is, 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 is very, very mysterious and very strange because it is this ultimate trick played on death of yeah. kind of taking death into into God and yeah. therefore, you know, transforming it, you know, basically it, yeah. Yeah, the, the joke of, of like, you know, the, of Hades and, and death thinking they've got God because they're bringing them down to death. And then yeah. it's like bringing a candle into the darkness. Yes. Like if you bring candle into the darkness, the opposite happens, right? You don't, darkness doesn't win, right? Darkness loses. So, so that type of, so let's say what else is a, what else is a big, a big misunderstanding. What about the of, double-headed eagle? You know, this is everywhere in orthodoxy yeah. and, and people, oh, that's a Scottish Rite Masonic thing. Well, no, 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 it's not. <laughs> it was, that existed way before there was any Scottish Rite of Masonry. So I don't know if people know yeah. this, but that goes back to the Byzantine <laughs> Empire and to the Roman exactly. Empire. So, Well, um, the double-headed serpent is really the two powers of, of Christendom, you could mm-hmm. say. It, it represents, the, it represents the, the, the church and the state. You know, usually you see them kind of together, but but it also represents de- in a more deeper fashion. It represents the two aspects of Christ. I've written some articles on that too. If people are interested, which is that Christ contains those two powers within Himself. You could say one is uh, one is something like uh, a toritas, direct influence. You see, with His right hand, He's blessing. So it's like a direct influence, right? It's like I have direct authority over you. And then the other side is secondary power or like uh, it's the written word. It's the written text. It's like a, it's like an envelope around real authority. It's like the uh, indirect, indirect authority, you could say, indirect power, you could say. And so that ends up being represented in different ways. Uh, You know, whether it be the church as having the direct authority 
and then the the state having this more indirect more more physical power but yeah. less authority you could say right. something like that right so the scripture has more power in the sense that you can look at it you can analyze it you know you can apply it directly uh, but it has less authority because it's not this direct influence of of, of the logos himself um and so often that's why you'll see for example the two-headed eagle you'll often see them like holding the two keys of peter sometimes because those are also the two this idea of like these two powers that are facing each other, right? The power to bind and to unbind. It's really is this kind of duality that exists ultimately, that is ultimately united in Christ. All these dualities kind of come together into Christ. So, yeah, another, I mean, what about the, the eye of providence? Because this one comes up all the time. People ask all the time and they'll always say, well, I was in, I saw a church one time that had an eye of providence. I said, well, even that is not, again, always signifying something Illuminati or Masonic. It's a symbol that goes back to the ancient world that just signified something like one of the divine attributes, like omniscience, right? Yeah. God sees all, God, God knows all. So again, it's a situation of context, giving the interpretation, giving the meaning. Would you agree with that? I, to I mean, I totally agree, you know, because this, this becomes silly, like you said, where I, I had this experience of going into a, a Catholic church right here in my city, you know, like a, it's like a, you know, it's like Quebec was was a rural area. You know, it's not like there was no power here. And so, in this like rural church, we walk in, and the tour, the guide is giving us a tour of this. It's a still a historical church, maybe like 18th century paintings. And so, in the in one of the one of the roof arches, there's a there's an eye of providence. And the guy in the tour says, "Oh, that means that this church was made by the Illuminati." And like, there's no way that this 18th century rural church in Quebec. Was made by the Illuminati, right? It, it, what it, it's actually an image of. It was seen as an image of the Trinity because it was a triangle, and then it also had the notion of, like you said, omniscience or or the capacity to, you know, this this eye that sees all basically is what what it's supposed to be. And so, you know, it's just like any symbolism. It it it. I think it it ended up being misused. And one of the problems that that people have is that people don't like, for example, a Freemasonry. People don't understand that. Freemasons took their symbolism mostly from Christians, not the exactly. other way around. Yes. And so exactly. the Freemasons at the outset, you don't, we don't exactly know, you know, exactly where it comes from. They say they they were the cathedral builders, right. that they had these this knowledge of architecture and this knowledge of building cathedrals. And so let's say that that's true. It means that at some point they went off the rails and started acting in different ways, but that even their own symbolism isn't necessarily evil. Maybe some right. of it is especially when 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 the more occult things start coming in the 19th century mm -hmm. but before that it's like a lot of it is just christian symbols and it's and so so it, it's not necessarily uh let's say evil in itself you know i, I actually you know i was talking to this I, I met just randomly some some 33rd degree mason who was a protestant right and and i didn't know i didn't like i've never really studied masonic symbols i'm not that interested in it but he was telling me about how they had the uh the cut stone and the uncut stone. And they had these two aspects of their thing. And I was thinking that's actually very biblical. Like, I, like that aspect of symbolism, like I can totally understand the idea of the, you know, you see it like the idea that some altars need to have be made out of uncut stone. Yeah. And so are kind of pure, but are also not worked. Right. So they, they lack refinement. So I was like, yeah, that's interesting. I don't see it evil in itself. Now I don't know. Like I, you know, obviously, you know, as, as the, as these kind of Western esoteric branches started joining with uh freemasonry then then you know all these weird images started to uh, to become or be twisted or whatever that yeah. is but i think people just have to be careful when they look at these images and understand like i said that a lot of them come from christianity first and then were twisted later exactly yeah yeah i mean uh, uh another example i often bring up is uh there's such a thing as the gnostic cross and i'm sure people have seen this but this is like a it looks like a uh uh like a like a <laughs> what you would put in, in a sights to shoot a gun. It looks like it's a circle with a cross and it's known as the Gnostic cross. And well, where do you think that they got that? They took it from the church's cross. I mean, it's just borrowing. I mean, the Celtic cross looks like a Gnostic cross, right? Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, I'm glad that we hit on that. That, that, that stuff comes up all the time. Um, we got, uh, I don't know. I mean, you're well, I, I, I'm having a great chat with you, but I also don't want to take too long. If you had other things you want to do, no, I'm fine. Like okay. it, as long as you want it, I'm, I think it's just going great. So let's yeah. Going. And we do have uh, some super chats. Are you, are you okay with taking? Sure. Questions? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. And remember everybody, when you send your super chat, that it that needs to be within all, uh, the guidelines. I'm not going to read any degenerate, disgusting <laughs> comments. So please keep them within the bounds of, 
you know, what's appropriate for the topic tonight. Um, what about um, liturgical abuse? Uh, uh, and I bring that up because when it comes to mostly the Roman Catholic world, mostly uh, maybe, I guess you could say the Protestant world to a degree, they don't really have a liturgy. Some of them have liturgy, but um, do you see, how, how can I phrase this? We both have talked, you and I both, in, in different shows, podcasts, we've talked about inversion a lot and how that's a, a, it seems to be a pattern that we see in dark spiritual forces to take yeah. things that are good. We see this with symbolism and invert it, right? If you think of the pentacle or the pentagram, that's a classic symbol of man. And then the inverted pentagram is like the inversion of man. It's like yes. man pointing down, man die, man go down, right? So do you see that? in the the abuses of liturgy that seem to be really prominent in the last say 50 years in different traditions and even in the orthodox church to a degree and that maybe not as bad as uh the the roman catholic and protestant worlds but is the, do you see that inversion and, and an attack on the liturgy as something that is a is a, a, a demonic spirit basically oh yeah i think uh, yeah i think that, that that some of these have become so egregious that they're nothing less than just just satanic like some of these are and I mean, I'm not saying that the people who do them are Satanists or anything like that, right. but I think they're animated. They're animated by a spirit of inversion. Uh, you know, one of the craziest examples, I don't know if you saw that, that uh, they, um, in, in England, in England, they're losing their minds. They, they put up this like carnival slide in, oh, yeah. the, in the nave. You saw this, right? Yeah. And the bishop like went up there, did his homily and then slid and down slid. <laughs> this slide. And, wee! and I was thinking, like, could you get, like, it's like, snake, it's like snakes and ladders, right? He's basically like going down the snake as he's in church and it's a carnival. And I'm thinking like, so I think that a lot of these have become so egregious that they're, they're actually... They're actually sometimes worth paying attention to to kind of understand what the upside down looks like because you know you could have had warnings of saints you know a few hundred years ago about about the antichrist or about you know what you know and, and it was vague but now it's nothing of it is vague because you can actually see you know things become you know like these clown masses that are that that the, that the catholic church uh not all i mean that some weird catholic churches are engaging in and uh you know this the, also just the desire to make everything as informal as possible yeah in, in in the liturgical space that's also a kind of breakdown of uh of meaning it's just an image of this this kind of breakdown the disco masses i mean there's so many there are so many that we could that we could that we could say and obviously obviously now the big one that's going to take up space and is already doing it in kind of liberal episcopalian type churches is the, the celebration of, uh, of of the lgbt agenda as becoming let's say like a, for them like an actual image of sanctity like an image of what is holy that inclusivity is that is the image of holiness itself and that openness and inclusivity and and variability is the very image of of uh, of god and so it, it ends up being really the the upside down of what is is true which is that god is calling us towards one calling us towards transcending our 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 idiosyncrasies and our divisions and our tribalism doesn't mean that those can't exist that is right we do exist in particulars but that god that christ is calling us to move into him mm -hmm. as much as possible and, and move beyond these 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 uh these idiosyncrasies but now they're using this kind of weird inclusivity as an image of that like they think that inclusivity is an image is kind of inclusivity without judgment i don't know if you have you seen the um the dancing freeze of saints have you ever seen this i'm not sure oh man you you'll have you need to look at this you have a blast it's a church in california it's an episcopal it's actually it's actually saint gregory of nisa church which is sad but uh but it's a uh, it they have a freeze of saints up in the uh up in the middle of the church and it's all these saints doing the can can they're all dancing uh and and there are legitimate saints in there you know let's say there's augustine and yeah. there's saint basil or whatever but there's also you know like uh, ella fitzgerald and harvey milk and <laughs> And like John Coltrane and and uh, and I, Albert Einstein and and so they're all and they're dancing doing the can can um, and so you can really see this kind of just complete breakdown of hierarchy this complete breakdown of meaning you know what it means to be a saint what it means to be holy you know it just ends up uh, but it ends up looking upside down because they're actually celebrating them right they're actually putting them up in the church as images to look at you know while you're worshiping God it's like man. It reminds me of when I was uh, 18 and, and I 
had just began reading the Bible at the time. I, I didn't really know much of anything. I was kind of getting a little bit of a sense of good and evil because I'd been just totally a, a wild party degenerate guy in high school. And, and I took a, a senior trip to New York and we toured a bunch of big cathedrals and churches there. And I want to say, I don't remember, I want to say this was a Methodist church. And I didn't know anything about the Bible at the time. I just started reading like maybe the Beatitudes, you know, the Gospel of Matthew or something. And I remember we went in this, I think it was a Methodist cathedral, and they literally had had uh, just installed a uh, stained glass window that had the apostles riding around in a Corvette. And I was like, <laughs> I'm not joking. I was like, what? And so it, we we did, you know, the St. John the Divine Cathedral, the big Episcopal Cathedral there too. And I remember thinking how weird and kind of new agey it was. And what what do you mean what do you make of the weirdness? I mean, I get like the inversion in the sense of like the really satanic stuff, but yeah. I don't understand the, the weirdness. Like what, the weirdness. what is what's with yeah. the apostles in a Corvette? I don't get yeah. that. Yeah. Well, it it has it really has to do with uh, the end. It has to do with the end. I'm sorry to say. So if you if you kind of understand, you know, what we talked about the idea that uh, I talked about the medieval manuscript, you know, and how you have the image in the center. And then on the border, you'll have the the ornamentation. And then you also have idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy and monstrosity. You'll have little little monsters, little little weird figures in the in the borders. And if you look at the first cycle, let's say in scripture from the fall to the flood, you get that same image, right? You have this movement down the mountain, a mountain of paradise, moving out into the into the chaos. And then what happens is you have mixture, you have giants, you have monsters, basically. And so that's the weirdness. Weirdness is just a breakdown of meaning. And so it it, oh. it, it it's a breakdown of hierarchy. It's coming to the edge of an of an identity, yeah. and now experimenting the idiosyncrasy of of that identity. It's like. You know, you have the central, the central, the central image of the garden, and then at the edge of that, you have the monster. Okay. Think of like the Pliny's map is like that, right? You have the Omphalos yeah, right. in the middle, and then on the edge, you have all these monsters racing. The creatures. So that's where we creatures. are. We're we're that's where we we're at the edge of the world with all the monsters coming out, and it's manifesting itself in all kinds, like something as silly as Sesame Street, where all these monsters are your friends. You know, this idea of monstrosity as as and you know the idea of like uh, how to train your dragon, where ultimately the dragons end up being better than us, right? All of this imagery, it's in the zeitgeist, like it's in the it's in the air because we are at the end of something, like we're reaching the end of something. And so because of that, you know, that's why the seventy genders and you know all this breakdown of identity into idiosyncrasy, that's the image. And so the weirdness is, it's like a, it really is like this modern pulse like this mod, mod modern like a thrust to go against the meaning yeah and to manifest idiosyncrasy because because we think it's cool because we think it's because we think it's edgy you know even think about that word yeah. edgy like we're, right. we're edgy like over the so edge into the abyss yeah, yeah, yeah that's right and so i think that that's what it is and so that's why there's this this celebration of of weirdness as almost like a value uh, in itself. And it has to do with the celebration of mixture and it has to do with the celebration of idiosyncrasy. So. Yeah. Well, it makes me think of like the, like, like Hieronymus Bosch paintings, right. Where you've got these like, you know, weird creatures with that are supposed to signify the demonic, you know, where it's like a fish head with like a man's body <laughs> and like a giant butt, you know, coming out of his chest, yeah. literally like, like, like butt monsters walking around. Yeah. And, and, and Bosch was doing that to, I think, make your point right to signify that the closer that you get to the the abyss and to the to the realm of the demonic it gets into m the madness right the madness of the demonic and the chaos and and things don't make sense you know you've got talking butt creatures to be yeah. frank i mean yeah, hybridity is an image of the edge right that's yeah, what it go. is right. it's an image where so that's why like if you look at the image of uh, of saint george killing the dragon the traditional dragon in, in orthodox iconography is always a hybrid he's always Right, he's a he's a lizard with with bird wings and with with uh, mammal feet, and so he's a he's a category that doesn't exist. He's a he's a, a breakdown of categories, right? This experience of the strange, you know, and so that's what it is. Like the, when you experience something strange, when you experience something that you don't have a category for, it's going to present itself at first as a monster to you, as mm -hmm. something which is a mixture of two categories, right? So you, you can imagine the first the, the first time Greeks saw a hippopotamus, right? 
they don't have a category for it. So they're like, oh, it's a river horse, but it's obviously not genetically a river horse, but it's because I don't have a category for it. So I have to take, I see it's in a river, kind of looks like a horse. I'm going to give it some name because it just doesn't fit in my, in my world. It's an only font, Mr. Frodo. It's an only font, Mr. Frodo. It's an only font. (laughs) So so, so that's what's going on. And that's where we are now. Like we are in the world, like you said, like a, a great, and it, it, it's upside down and it's hybrid and it's inverted. You know those images, you, you probably watch uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, right? You know that image of like the guys blowing blowing trumpets out of their butts? Like that's an actual medieval image. They didn't make that up. Right. Like those exist in medieval manuscripts right. and they represent that edge, that upside down, where instead of air coming out of your mouth and being meaningful, you have air coming from accidental air coming from behind where it's uncontrolled and it's funny and it's, and it makes noise instead of meaning. And so it's like, it, and so that's where we are today. We have noise, accident and hybridity and mixture and, and all of these, these images of the edge. I remember when I was in high school, uh, I liked a lot of really weird music and, you know, just being, uh, people might not know, but I was actually an artsy person in high school and I almost went to art school and all my buddies were, you know, artsy type guys. And I remember, you know, we sort of celebrated that weirdness and we thought it was cool. And, and uh, I remember one time when I started going to church back then, it was a Protestant church, but there was a guy, I remember, I don't remember his name, but he was a pretty philosophically astute guy. And I was just getting into philosophy and, and he was looking through, you know, like my CD collection or something like that. And he's like, oh, you got uh, back, you've got, they might be giants. He's like, you have a lot of nonsense music in here. And I was like, I was like what do you mean nonsense music? He's like, it's all postmodern. And I was like, I was like, what? <laughs> but then I realized the more that I learned, you know, got into philosophy later on, I thought that, that guy was actually right. Like the music, and I'm not saying that it's always wrong to listen to secular music or to enjoy, yeah. you know, absurdity and comedy and that kind of stuff. But I, I did eventually come to realize, no, he actually had a point that in those kinds of musical trends, even though we can to a degree, I think, appreciate them, there is the notion of the breakdown of meaning and it is postmodern music because yeah. most of those songs are actually intentionally absurd and meaningless. Exactly. No, you're right. A good way to understand it traditionally, like you said, it's not that it's wrong in itself. It's all about place. It's all about things being in their proper place. So traditional societies always had their carnival, right? You know, we had right, Mardi right. Gras, we had Meat Fair, you know, the Jews have Purim, which is even straight out of the Bible, where you have a festival where meaning breaks down, right? At Purim, for example, the Jews dress up, they wear weird costumes, and it's said that they have to drink and turn on themselves until they fall down, right? So that's a great example, like getting drunk, losing meaning, everything kind of falling down. And so you see that and in the West, for example, they had the Feast of Fools, which was around the New Year's, where they would, you know, elect... Uh, someone to like a child to be a bishop or they would they would have a mock king and then everybody would would kind of pretend that he's the king and it would be this upside down that they had even a crazier liturgical practice in the west in the middle ages which was the the uh, the feast of the ass they would bring a donkey into the church all the way up to the altar uh and then at the end of the mass instead of saying amen they would actually bray people would bray but it was just this one time right um and so it, it was these festivals of inversion and then it's like it's that moment at the end of the world, at the end of the cycle, at the end of the year, where meaning breaks down, and then there's a resurrection, and then things kind of come back up. And so there was always been a there was always been a little bit of room for that. Like if you think about like in the Orthodox tradition, for example, the the um, meat fair, the the day before the the carnival. That's what carnival means, right? Carnival means meat fair. Meat fair is on the same day as the Last Judgment. We celebrate the Last Judgment and meat fair on the same day which has to do with this idea of the end, right? Hmm. It's like the end, the breakdown of meaning, then the judgment, and then the world starts up again, you could say. Uh, and so that's the pattern of everything. So now you can understand it that we're basically in a nonstop carnival. Like our whole world is just a carnival that's yeah. been going on for like, uh, you know, since World War II, just been kind of increasing since World War II. It's like massive carnival. Uh, and, and it's getting insane. It's getting more and more insane and, and more and more apparent that it's a it's a kind of a crazy carnival and then it turns into like a you know like those like horror carnivals like that's what it's becoming right yeah. the, this kind of imagery of the horror carnival when it all where it all goes wrong and then the the kind of zombie clowns come out to devour us all uh you know that's that's pretty much where we are yeah so what you're saying is basically there's a time and a place for when you're going to release your mumble rap cd 
right? That's what you're <laughs> That's saying. That's right. There's a place for mumble rap, and it's at a certain year, a certain once day. once a year we In put out our mumble cycle, rap theme. Then we then rap. we go back to the music. <laughs> but now it's nonstop mumbling. You know, it's been like that since the 1960s, at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time in the uh, notion of the prophetic or, or in the sense of the, the like when the saints have visions and this kind of stuff. I'm not saying there's not a place for it. It's just that we don't we don't talk about that a lot here because it's very speculative. But one of the uh, visions of the saints that did um, strike me as pretty prophetic over the years was uh, the, the dream that St. John of Cronstadt had where he uh, saw the this what what sounds like a clown mask and it's it's amazing because this is you know 1880s 90s when he had this vision so far it was even before you know the socialists in russia it was before uh you know the liturgical revolution of vatican ii and he talks about people dancing around the altar it sounds like a liturgical dance you know this kind of weird mm. stuff um uh, have, have you ever looked at that kind of a, of an analysis or, or, well, I've uh, never heard of that vision. So, so I'm pretty impressed by it. He said he saw like a clown mask. Right? Yeah. It literally, yeah, I mean, sense. some people will say the vision is just predicting like the Bolshevik or the, the socialist revolutions in yeah. Russia, but it actually sounds, it sounds like it does kind of sound like, but it sounds like more than that. It, it sounds like, cause he doesn't say that the enemies of the church, like come into the church and they defile the church. He says, the church adopts yeah. this uh, liturgical dance clown, and he says they're painted like clowns, and they're doing wow. they're doing a dance liturgy. That's amazing. It is amazing. That's, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. And so uh, the best way that for me to, to kind of understand it, it's it's also like I was I'm always careful. Like I, yeah. I I like to tell people like we're at the end of something. I'm not saying it's like the end of the world necessarily. I don't know. Right. Only God knows. But right. I think that we can recognize the end of patterns and what they look like. Like the edge of the world has a an objective reality to it. It looks like something. And 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 it looks like a breakdown of meaning. It looks all the things, the carnival, all the things we're talking about. <clears throat> and so you could see, like, for example, like in Weimar, for example, that's what happened. Like Weimar was a version of that, moved into this kind of chaotic, this chaotic space, and then it went too far, and then it 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 brought a beast let's say it brought about a beast let's say you could say something like the beast killed the whore right the the whore was riding the beast mm -hmm. and then at some point the beast kills the whore and the beast takes over and so you can kind of see that that like you get a sense that that's what's going on now like you get a sense that we're at the end of the carnival and the beast is coming to devour the whore and we have these systems of control which are looming in our face uh and you know this system of identification and control which are kind of looming on us and look like this moment, which is described in Revelation as this flip between the moment of the whore and the beast. And so I think that these patterns, like I, I think these are the patterns of reality. And so I, and I so I think they have little manifestations, and we can recognize them as they as they happen. Uh, and I without and you don't have to say like okay the end is nigh, it's the end of the world, everything yeah. is like you know Christ is returning tomorrow. Like I don't know any of that, but but I do know that I can recognize that moment. Let's say that moment where the, the beast is about to kill the whore, I can see it coming. And it's like, it's coming very fast. Uh, a little bit off topic, but I just remember that I wanted to mention this uh, maybe about 20 minutes ago when we were talking about sort of the cycles of, of birth and death and, and the liturgical cycle. Uh, a movie comes to mind. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, did you ever by chance see the original Wicker Man? No, I, I, didn't, I didn't see that. Now it is uh, a pretty relatively intense horror movie, so I'm not. I don't typically recommend it. everybody go out and watch a bunch of horror movies. However, this one is interesting because you you have this character who is the police chief who represents law and order, and he's actually a Christian, mm. and he is tasked with going to this island off the coast of Scotland somewhere, and it's like this island that's kind of removed from the rest of civilization, and they're doing their own thing there. And as, as I won't spoil the movie, but as it turns out, it's uh, essentially they're doing a kind of human cult sacrifice there. Right. And they've kept the old ways of the old pagan religion. And, but it's just odd that because they have this notion that we owe a sacrifice. We owe this this debt, this sacrifice to the earth. Mm. We have to pay Mother Earth the blood or else we won't get the, the harvest, basically. Yeah. And they also have this weird uh, it, it's like old English folk traditions and and. Uh, Scottish folk traditions that include all these characters I'd never even heard of before, like John Barleycorn. Have you heard of this? No. This guy. So this is this weird idea that you make a little bread man, and the bread man is like 
He's a, he's a, a, if you can't do a human sacrifice, he's the best thing that you do when you don't have a human sacrifice and you, you bake this little bread man you <laughs> and, eat the bread. and you eat the bread and man. Then you eat the bread. Right. So it, it's just, it's odd to me because even in this go goofy pagan, uh, you know, horror movie, it's a you know famous horror movie, but and by the way, if you're looking for a good laugh, watch the Nicolas Cage remake of it. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> Nicholas Cage just goes nuts. And we, I, I was he like, are we going to have a conversation where Nicholas Cage isn't even mentioned once? I guess they, never, there it is. It never, no, that, this is literally happens. all I talk about. No. <laughs> I can't even get away from it. Like last night I was on a guy's podcast and we were, and then sure enough, here, when are you going to do the Nicholas Cage impersonation? I was like, oh, man. Do I have to do it every time I'm on somebody's podcast? Anyway, but um, I just want, uh, uh, what do you think about maybe that kind of a thing? Like, isn't it interesting that even in sort of pagan religions, we have this notion that we, we seem to sort of, even if they don't have a direct uh, personal knowledge of God, there's like this implicit sense that we kind of owe something to something out there. And we got to, we have to pay this thing. And yeah. I'm not trying to reduce Christianity to a payment debt model of Protestantism, yeah. but uh, you get what I'm saying. And, and there's this idea that we have to partake of this thing. We have to eat it, right? This kind yeah. of thing. No, I think you're right. I think that, you know, I think that sacrifice is the, I'd say the world is built on sacrifice. You know, the, 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 the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. It's something that's hard to understand because we tend to understand sacrifice as just a consequence of sin and all that. But there, I think there's a deeper element according to which for reality to exist. We talked about this problem of multiplicity, right? And so, and so this is a real problem. Like in order for, let's say, a team to exist, let's say if you want, you're playing soccer. In order for a team to exist, all the players in that team have to sacrifice some idiosyncrasy of themselves in order to participate in the team, right? They have to stop thinking about their girlfriend. They have to stop, you know, they have to stop doing other things in order to participate. So unity of, of a group always involves sacrifice. This is, a, this is a necessary aspect of it. And I think that it's also normal that that would become ritualized to a certain extent, that that would become, that would ultimately become ritualized. I think René Girard is kind of right on, I think, in some of the things that he, that he talks about in terms of mimetic desire and this, the problem of, of being together and then, and then also wanting what other people want and then this whole scapegoat mechanism that, that kind of uh, that sets itself up. So I think that this is something which is just, like you said, it's inherent to being human and to being intelligent and to, having, and to seeing how these things come together and how there's a need to... to to compress and to sacrifice things, um, and uh, and then ultimately that leads to to Christ as the final solution to that, and as a Christian as a self sacrifice, right? That's what ends up being the ultimate solution to the problem of sacrifice is that no, you don't sacrifice others, you sacrifice yourself. That's mm. how we solve this problem. But as Christianity breaks down, sacrifice is gonna come back. There's no way around it. Yes. You know, there's no exactly. way around it, and it's gonna. It can happen informally, like like things things like abortion. Like abortion is is a is an obvious human sacrifice because that's what it is. It's like someone says, "I want to have a certain life," and here's this, and I'm going to sacrifice my child to have that life. It's just a it's just a basic trade off of what a human sacrifice is. It's not it's not uh, ritualized, but it nonetheless participates in the same pattern as ritual uh, sacrifice. And so, it seems inevitable that that these types of images will will appear just more and more, you know, exactly. like the whole George Floyd thing was really about that. Like it was all about a weird, a weird mimetic sacrifice and, and, and like a, a watching someone die, you know, killed by an authority and then having like a weird ecstatic communion, you know, after that is very strange. It was, it was a very strange religious influx of kind of mis misunderstood religious, uh, religious patterns. Uh, but that's going to happen more and more, right? As Christianity wanes, people think they're just going to hold on to their nice little Christian morality, and uh, and and that you know, without Christianity, we're still going to be nice and and have you know the Sermon on the Mount. But that's not that's not what's going to happen. It's, no, paganism no. is going to come yeah, flooding uh, back uh, in. Paganism will fill the void. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so let's get to some of these super chats. Remember, sure. guys, uh, uh, if you would uh, keep them uh, in uh, you know uh, civil and clean. Uh, Palantir for five dollars. Now, the way we usually do it here, uh, Jonathan, is that uh, I let the guest uh, uh, reply, and then I'll give a comment. So, sure. uh, most of the questions are are, are probably going to be for you. Palantir five dollars. Can you comment on the idea that Christ embodies reconciliation of opposites? For example, 
We read of Christ as king and outcast, victim and victor, critic and fulfillment of the law. What is the orthodox understanding of this pattern if we contrast it or excuse me, compare it to Jung? I don't know much. People think that I know a lot about Jung, but I don't. I, I'm interested. I find Jung very uninteresting. Uh, but I think that definitely that's what Christ is doing. And you see, you see that he he is really, you know, St. Maximus talks about man as the as the laboratory, the mediator of extremes, you could say. But then that culminates into Christ. And so if you read his story, you, it's it crazy. Like there's so many. There's so much reconciliation happen in, in his story. And it's also, it also, it's funny because scholars struggle to kind of classify his story because they're like, how does this work? You know, he's a, he's a shepherd, but he's also, you know, uh, he's, a, he's also a farmer, like in terms of, 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 so it's like Cain and Abel. He's a, you know, he, he's a, he says, they say he's a priest, but he's also a king. And then he's also like a technician, like a carpenter's son. And then mm -hmm. he's also, so it's like, he's just all these things kind of brought in together into into one person and so i think that that's really what it's an image of what it's an image of of what it is to be called into god that is even in yourself that's what you end up having to do is that you know you're you and yourself have these opposites that are pulling you apart you're, everybody experiences it and and it's experience of the passions you can hate and love somebody at the same time it's like what is going on I'm being ripped apart by this and and that's what christ is kind of calling us to do is to bring all this multiplicity into unity. It doesn't deny the duality and it doesn't deny the multiplicity, but it is nonetheless a kind of, it ends up being more like a, uh, yeah, like a feast, you know, all these images that Christ uses, like this, this joining together of, of, of all these, the, this multiplicity, the band of apostles that are joined together in the boat or, you know, at the, you know, uh, when you see uh, at the Ascension, this band of apostles or Pentecost, that's what we're called to do. Um, and I and I think that we sh we need to not shy away from that understanding because you'll struggle to understand Christ's story if you don't want to see him as a, as reconciling everything in himself because for like I said for modern literary critics they just see it as this weird chaotic like broken story mm -hmm. but it's like no it's not it's actually joining together all the stories into one yeah uh, one confusion too from a philosophical perspective that people who, uh, I'm not talking about you, I'm saying people who ask this question, um, perhaps the, the questioner, is that they will uh, confuse uh, the idea of the opposites in the sense of metaphysical or existent opposites. For example, good and evil are opposites. So in that sense, Christ doesn't reconcile <clears throat> good and evil because evil is not a thing. To be reconciled, to have a kind of unification requires that both things have some notion of ontology being existence. Evil doesn't have being. Evil is a privation of being in both Neoplatonism and in Christianity. So there's no sense in which Jesus like makes good and evil come together, right? That would be like Charles Manson theology. Okay, we're not doing Charles Manson theology. Charles Manson theology. And for I mean, and for Carl, Carl Jung, uh, you know, Jung as a kind of uh, pl Platonist uh, or as a kind of uh, Gnostic, ultimately, Carl Jung believes that that evil and and the opposite of evil actually have a real existence. He has mm. an essay called Aeon where he says that Jesus and Satan are really just flip sides of the same coin. Yeah. So I would just say that it's two different notions of what it means to reconcile opposites. So what Jesus reconciles, according to Saint Maximus, I think it's Ambigua ten and Ambigua forty one or two. He says that Jesus gathers together all of the things that the fall kind of split and fractured into himself. That's not evil. It's the things yeah. that have being that are split and fractured against each other. So he takes Jew versus Gentile, fractured mm. and split, brings them back. That's what it's talking about to, quote, reconcile opposites, as well as the things that Jonathan talked about, right? Like uh, these, these sort of um, different types of, of roles in Christ's life as humble poverty, you know, carpenter versus, uh, you know, royal king. Okay, so yes, he reconciles those things. Yeah. Um, Eric, yeah. wow, 100 bucks, Eric. Uh, and as we know, I will give Jonathan a portion of these Super Chats. I give the guests a portion. Uh, John, he says, uh, thank you, Jonathan and Jay. You guys are both pointing people to the light. Exactly. Uh, Palantir, $5. With the rollout of... Okay, so I'm going to have to talk in code because you guys know we can't talk about all this stuff in here. So with the rollout of tech things that are coming, are we beginning to enter into a 
uh, sort of global order or a 666 type of system uh, as we see in Revelation. So I think he's asking, is this something yeah. in Revelation? I would say, it, it, well, I'm going to let Jonathan answer first. Um, do you, um, he's, that's his question. Too. I, I mean, I think so. I think that the further, like I've been very cautious about talking about this. If you go on my channel, you'll find I did a, a, a video called The Mark of Cain recently, which starts to address this. And I've got a video coming up called The Mark of the Beast, which I'm hesitating to put out just because I don't want to put pour oil on the fire or anything. Um, but there is a sense in which the idea of the idea of identification, just the idea of, of, of identification as a means to participate in society is moving us toward a serious problem, yeah. you know, uh, in terms of this 666 symbolism, the idea of accounting for everything. You know, I talked, I did a video on 666 and I talked about this, that 666 symbolism seems to be about perfection, actually, it seems to be about the idea of trying to account for, for, for all things. And it's like, it's actually like a perfect number in the, in the bad sense. That it's it's it tries to be all inclusive, mm. and that seems to be what's what's going on. You can see six 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 symbolism in the desire to include all these, all these freak identities to name them right to actually name them and to make them part of a system, and then ultimately that comes to this problem of, of uh, of tracking and identification as means to participate in the world. So it's like a it's a desire to have perfect control over things, and I think that we're definitely seeing that. Whether it's the six six six, you know, that's described in scripture, it's participating in that pattern for sure, yeah. and it's something we need to be very attentive to and cautious about. I would agree. Uh, Jay Broad, ten dollars. Thank you both for your work in the church fathers. We sometimes see uh, f the phrase "nature as scripture" or "nature as a witness to the Creator." Would you care to comment on that and the patristic view of creation? And also, would you suggest any books on this topic? Uh, glory to God. Um, yeah, I, I, for sure. I think, I mean, the whole, the, the, you know, creation sings things to the creator and all of creation is full of his glory. And it's, it's actually dependent on us to, in our own process of sanctification, to be able to perceive it. And so for sure, it's somewhat veiled for us because we are, because we're distracted, because we're sinners, because we're all these things. But if you read, if you read the testimony of the saints and you read stories of, of some of the saints that reach theosis, you really get a sense in which you know they see the world as 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 bright, as glowing, as just as a theophany, basically. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that that's definitely not only possible, but that's ultimately one of the things we're supposed to be aiming towards. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, specifically uh, to the guy that asked, I would say. Um, if you're looking for an introduction to St. Maximus, this little blue book from St. Vladimir is uh, what I would recommend. Um, the specific uh, Ambigua is Ambigua 10 that goes into a lot of detail about how he sees creation manifesting the Logi. Uh, and then there is a good book that goes into the philosophy of the Cappadocians by Yaroslav Pelikan. It's called uh, Christianity and Classical uh, Thinking, the Metamorphosis of Natural Theology by, by Pelican, which is really good on how the Cappadocians viewed, quote, the theology of nature or natural theology. And then uh, Dr. Bradshaw just put out this book, which I'm not done with, but working through. If you're looking for uh, a, an inter uh, uh, dialogue between some Roman Catholics and Orthodox theologians uh, on natural theology. So... Thank you for that, Jay Broad. Josh Anderson for $5. I love that I'm seeing this. Well, we love you too, Josh. And we love that you're seeing this and that you love us. We love that you love us and we love you. John Anon, $5. Thank you, John Anon. He says, silence. He says nothing. Ossifrage, $1. Jay, I'm a fan. I trust, I'm a trusted member in your Discord server. I've been in the server for a year and I strive to be... <laughs> To be a dire court policeman, for the, those that don't know, we have instituted these new uh, sort of police officers due to uh, some scandals that we've had in our Discord. Please keep uh, making good videos, and I will add more donations. Well, thank you for that, uh, Ossifrage. Ossifrage, for $5. Jay, I heard you say that statuary was banned in the 7th Ecumenical Council. I don't remember saying that. I remember saying that there were uh, bans on, quote, pagan art, uh, but I don't think it was intended to be this across-the-board banning of all statues. I mean, Orthodox churches at times have had statuary, although I don't think they're typically 
you know, like in the sanctuary, they might be, but um, yeah. I don't, I don't recall saying that the uh, seventh council specifically mentioned statuary. Um, you so said, the, the, if you want yeah, to know right. where that comes from in, in the, the in the uh, ecumenical council, it doesn't ban statuary, but it comes from the rudder Yeah, in, okay. in the rudder. He, he interprets <laughs> the canon of the seventh ecumenical council as saying that the image represents something else. Whereas a statue, because it's three dimensional, it's the thing in itself. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't know, like I find I find that type of argumentation a little difficult. Um, but in reality, statuary never took on in the Orthodox tradition. It's just not just not a part of the tradition. And so right. there's no reason to go against the tradition, right? There's no reason to innovate to innovate. We just you know once in a while there are idiosyncratic statues which have appeared and even been venerated in in the church. Um, and we can just let them be and it's fine. We don't, but we also don't have to make a church full of statues. It would just be silly because it's just not, just not the way that the church ended up manifesting it. And the difficulty with statues that you also often have is that because of this, this structure that I talked about, like, because the, the icon, let's say the carved icon, two like two dimensional or the, or a painted or mosaic icon, you can have this whole pattern of the top of the image with heaven and the bottom of the image with earth. And you can kind of lay out the image together with all these elements coming, you know, kind of relating to each other. Whereas it's harder to do that with statuary. You'd almost have to create like a diorama with like all these statues. And 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 when you see a statue from behind, it's weird because you're you're not encountering the saints. So there's all these problems in terms of the way that we treat icons and the way that we venerate them and statuary. So it's not, I've made statues for Catholic patrons. Like I've accepted to do that. But if an Orthodox person asked me to make a statue, I'd ask a lot of questions. Like I'd ask a lot of questions before I'd said, yeah. So like, why do you want this? Like, what are you, what are, what are you trying to accomplish? Like, what's the point here? So there's, uh, by the way, uh, there's also nuance on the seventh ecumenical council, because for example, the Synodicon, uh, it actually gets things added to it over time. And I don't even know if everybody, if anybody even knows exactly what the original Synodicon's list of things that were prohibited are. I just recall that, in my reading, there's the idea that the Synodicon had the intention of banning, quote, pagan art, but exactly what constitutes pagan art, there's uh, probably some flexibility there. So I wasn't trying to be a rigorist on that also French. Yeah. Also and for French. sure, like you wouldn't have you wouldn't have pagan statues or pagan images inside the church. And sure. the fact that that maybe they said that shows you, you know, maybe some of the some of the things that were out of out of whack at the time you know in constantinople you had pagan art it was there you would have pagan statues in the gardens out in the mm. streets there were statues of hercules of different heroes in that were even remainders from roman time uh, but they were always lower let's say they're always lower than the churches always lower and never in the churches never you yeah. know uh, so it was more like a, a hierarchy of imagery you remember the the ancient past we, we you know we have uh, some some sympathy for it and some affection sure. for it but we also know what its place is it's in the court it's, it's not in the church yeah and uh also for age if you if you didn't see the interview with uh father vladimir i would recommend that too because we go into that as well and he makes the point that jonathan just made about how if you look at russian cities like saint petersburg they kind of had uh the same notion that there's there's certain art that's you know applicable to museums and palaces and then certain things that are only really appropriate in the church that wouldn't be those things right so yeah. so uh, uh also there was a statue of justinian in constantinople a huge statue on a pillar which was mm -hmm. i don't know like his leg was the size of a man there's this <laughs> massive statue of justinian up on a pillar that was there until the fall of constantinople and so it's like you know orthodox were used to seeing uh, yeah. statues just not in not not so much in church also, Frage again says, uh, Jay, I'm a fan of pre schism Western Orthodoxy. Uh, I've never attacked it. I don't know where people, somebody said that I was against. No, I went to a Western Rite liturgy literally two months ago, so I'm not against Western Rite liturgy. Uh, what is your uh, view of the Western Rite being resurrected? I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, we, one of my good friends who was a Uniate just came into the church and he's in the Western Rite, so shout out to, to, uh, uh, to Justin, uh, Third Eye News. So don't have any problem with it. I, I don't think that certain devotions that are uh, like Jesuit Nestorian devotions, which I see the Sacred Heart as, are appropriate. I don't think those things are appropriate in Orthodox. So, but my problem is not, I don't have any problems with the Western Rite. 
Uh, I don't know if you have any comment on Western, right? No, I really, I don't. I mean, I, I think that it's, um, I've seen some, some do it successfully and others go off, go off the rails. It's, it's, it's a little harder because the hierarchy is not the, it's like, it's kind of like trying to implant something in a different hierarchy. Mm. Uh, but if anybody pulls it off, then I, you know, I'll be happy to see it. Jmail $50 Orthodox art and iconography all seems to be the same style of art. Does it all go back to the Byzantine empire? And thank you for this fantastic conversation. I think that there are two things going on here. One is that we always see things that we don't understand as being the same. Let's say, how can I say that? Like when we're not used to looking at things, we, we tend to see them as the same. So there's actually quite a bit of variability in the style of images uh, in the Orthodox tradition from, you know, from the, the early centuries up until now. So there's actually quite a bit of variability, but there's also a flavor. There's also something which unites it together, which makes you recognize it as, as Eastern art. Um, and so, so I think that that's the way to see it is to understand that there is, and it's also about, you know, just how you kind of interact with the church. Like you don't want to rock the boat. Like why would you, you want to create something that would, will be recognized by the church as something that they recognize, like it's something that, that they can participate in and that they don't, that doesn't jar them. So because of that, it tends to kind of slowly change and, you know, get adapted to different, uh, like Russian art looks very different from Byzantine art, but you can see that they, that they have the same spirit, let's say, but, but visually they, they can be quite different. Mustard Tiger, $30. Thank you, Jonathan and Jay. This is incredible work uh, that you're doing for Christ in this turbulent time in history. You've been a blessing. Glory to God. Thank you very much, Mustard Tiger. Appreciate that. Uh, Jay Mel, again, $10. Um, I don't know this. I'll, I'll, I'll ask this, Jonathan. What is the meaning of the mushroom in the throne of Peter? i never seen any of i never seen that. The mushroom in the throne of Peter? There, <laughs> there's a lot. You have to be careful with... Uh, how can I say it? You have to be really careful with a lot of people that look at things and see things in them. You know, like they, you, you have that stupid book about how the, how, you know, Christianity, the mushroom or whatever, where it's like all the crosses. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so you really have to be careful. And I saw, I don't know what image you're referring to, but, uh, you know, I would be very surprised that there would be, I mean, unless it's like in the ornamentation that there's a mushroom in the ornamentation, that's possible, but Do I, you it's like not. Like I did acid one time and I realized that like, that's what Ezekiel was seeing. Like, yeah. you see, like, <laughs> Nectar oh, man. Nectaria $50. Wow. Thank you. Uh, keep up the work for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Nectaria. Much appreciated. Um, Pano, what's up, Pano? Uh, he says for $5, Jay, uh, <laughs> you forgot to link Jonathan's OnlyFans in the description. I'll add Jonathan's OnlyFans later. <laughs> He's just joking. Joseph, yeah. $5. Jonathan, uh, how do you navigate a largely heterodox audience? Do you feel that you need to maybe at times tone down your power level in order to help reach your audience to bring a proper relationship to Christ and his church? I Yeah, I feel like if you watch if you watch my videos, you'll see that I kind of, it's like a difficult, it is a difficult balancing, I, I feel. Because I would say like half of the people watching my content or are, are atheists or kind of post-Christian. And so, so what I end up doing is I end up separating it by videos. And so mm. like some videos you'll see, you know, I'm like quoting St. Ephraim and I'm quoting St. Gregory and I'm really, you know, or I'm just doing an interpretation of a, of a biblical text. And then, or I'm talking about icons or whatever. And then other videos will be on more, let's say kind of more bridge subjects where I'm talking about culture in general, or I'm talking about political phenomena or, you know, explaining the symbolism in a movie. <clears throat> and so that's how I, I tend to do it. And so what I hope is that people can kind of move from the more, uh, you know, or I'll use words that aren't from the fathers. I can talk about consciousness, which obviously the fathers never talk about consciousness, but you can use these words to kind of help people slowly mm -hmm. come closer to what the, the fathers are talking about um, and then move them, move them that way. So it, it is, it is sometimes I, cause sometimes some, some person who just started watching my videos will watch a video where I basically take for granted that you know what the life of Moses is. Like, you know these things, you take them for granted, and then then they think I'm spouting gibberish. So it's difficult, right? Because you can't be always starting from the beginning every time you talk to people. So eh, we do what we can, you know? Yeah, and, and uh, we, do, we have similar challenges yeah. here as well with different audiences. But Pano says again, $3. Jonathan, do you see any glimmer of hope 
in the culture for a cosmic flip towards a proper view of hierarchy on the horizon? I, I, I think that we can start actually start to see that. I think there's a little, there's some glimmer. I think that the, <clears throat> one of the things that I find interesting is to notice, let's say something like, like the, 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 let's say this Jordan Peterson phenomena, right? That I've been kind of associated with somehow. What, what you see in that is there's a lot of error and there's a lot of problems with what he says and what, how people receive it. But in that, there's definitely a bunch of people who never could have understood what God, nothing about God, nothing about religion, nothing about liturgy, nothing about anything religious, who all of a sudden have this capacity to even understand what we're talking about. Like when we talk about potential, when we talk about Logi, when we talk about these words that, that, that people used to think is just a bunch of gibberish, now all of a sudden they're like, well, wait a minute, he's actually talking about my experience. He's actually talking about something which I experience every day uh, and so I think that in, in this kind of strange moment, uh, I do see a glimmer of hope. And I think that, you know, I think that Jay, you probably have a similar experience where all of a sudden we're seeing in the past few years, like, you know, thousands of young men, especially young men for some reason, kind of returning to Christianity, a lot of them converting to orthodoxy. And so, and so in that, I do see a glimmer. I don't necessarily see it as a, like the entire culture is going to flip. I see it more like maybe an art that will kind of take us through the, the dark times. I see a lot darker times ahead, yeah. but I do see that in that there's going to be some kind of seed or something that will be bright and will be able to kind of carry us through. The master for $2. Uh, do you have any thoughts on Jordan Peterson converting to orthodoxy? I can just, I just, I just decide. I mean, at this point, I really just kind of said, you know, God, this is your thing. Really, like this is what I've done. Like I feel like I, I feel like I've talked to him and I presented things to him, and and he came really close. You know, he 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 talked about baptism. We we talked about it privately. Like he came very close, but in the end, you know, it's his it's his story, it's his journey, and I can't. I I don't know what's gonna happen. I all I can do is I can really thank God that despite his you no know, no matter what his own personal journey ends up bringing him towards. I can thank God that in that I've seen a lot of people come to Christ and come to the church. And so, so to me, I'm, I just try to remain grateful for that and pray for his soul and pray for him and his, and his condition, because he's, he's obviously not still not doing very well. So, um, so yeah, so I'm just pray for, pray for Jordan Peterson, you know, pray for those that follow him also, because a lot of them have that first little glimpse where they can maybe move yeah. closer to, uh, to the church. I get uh, when people ask me, when is Alex Jones going to become Orthodox? When is Sam Hyde going to become Orthodox? And I feel like it's a similar situation. It's like, well, hopefully soon. Keep praying for them, right? Uh, and we've seen, like, we've seen some crazy stuff happen before, right? And so, like, Roosh, like, who would have who thought, right? Like, you know, five years ago, like, who, who could have predicted something like that? And so, like, we have these, we have these crazy uh, surprises. And so I think we'll see more of them on the horizon. Yeah, absolutely. Pano says three dollars. Jonathan, would you consider Saint John Chrysostom uh, Paschal homily as a kind of inversion? I always found, I always found his insistence on everyone stuffing themselves with the full and <laughs> table as striking compared to the usual stress on fasting. Well, it's a feast. What do you expect? The, the, the way to understand Saint John Chrysostom's homily is actually to read to to first read the the. Uh, the, the, the Holy Saturday homily, the homily that came the day before. Like if you read the homily that came before, he talks about the fire of hell and he talks about, he just like lays it out to you. Like this is, this is the hardest moment. Like this is, talks about all the, the, the punishment and all of this, like he talks about that. And then, then he, then he comes to Pascha and then he, he, he opens the doors and says, and so you have to be able to see those two kind of held in tension as a, as the mystery of salvation and the mystery of, we don't know how all of this is going to play out or we don't totally we get it but we have these two these two images let's say of one which is this image of 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 a punishment in hell and of you know of the fire and then this image of god being all in all and filling all of reality and we don't totally understand how it's going to play out so i think that that's how you have to see it and when we get to the paschal homily and when we get to that moment where chrysostom opens the doors and says all come and, and eat of the feast, we have to be able to be there and to rejoice 
in that and to participate in that in the same way that we were there when we saw Christ on the cross and we wept and we and we participated in that. And so, we, but we always always had to see it in the whole the whole of the story. Let's say we can't just separate it and and, and have just that moment and think that that's all all there is. Made by Jim Bob, 50 bucks. Thank you for that. Wow. Uh, is it possible that veganism is an unconscious response to Carnival, making it metaphorically correct, but not literally? There, I understand what he means. What he means is that there is an intuition in us, and I think it's a true intuition, which is that somehow we are above the carnal world, let's say. You know, and then that's why that's why monks are vegetarian. Like monks are vegetarian; they don't eat meat. Uh, and so I think that that's the kind of intuition that people have. But I think I it's it's understood yeah. and it's and it's wrong. There's nothing wrong with eating meat. We we should you know if you're not a monk, you should eat meat. There's no there's no issue there's no issue about it. But but I think that people have this kind of weird intuition and then they turn it into a, that's why they're able to turn it into a religion yeah. because it feels like it's some kind of spiritual purity that they're engaging with. Yeah, exactly. Right. But I would say, uh, remember too, Paul says to Timothy that there will be false teachers that will come along and will forbid the eating of flesh. Yeah. And I bring that up because veganism, remember guys, as we've done many shows and podcasts with Tristan, veganism is an ethical position, which is that all animal products are inherently wrong and evil to you. So it's not just about your diet. In fact, the vegans will get on to you if you try to, uh, be a vegan for diet issues. Veganism is an ethical position distinct from vegetarianism. So keep that in mind as well. Yeah, that makes sense. And the monks, they monks, they do it out of con out of contrition and asceticism, right? They're not saying everybody should live like that. They're saying I'm actually sacrificing something which I would like to be able to kind of you know gather my body into prayer. Uh, and that's different from like you said this kind of ethical position where it's like. You know this finger wagging uh, veganism, which always ends well. Up I mean, if, if a monk has a, a a leather sandal, that's not vegan. That's right. It's you not vegan. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, go boy Esau, twenty dollars. Thank you for all that you do, Mister Dyer. Dyer uh, hail Jesus. So, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Jay Poopy, fifty dollars. I just want to thank you both, uh, both of you gentlemen, for your aid. I would, if it was not for you guys, I would still be an atheist. Oh, that's great to hear. Uh, I've been going to an Orthodox church every week for the last, uh, the last six months and we'll be getting baptized soon. God willing. Wow. Thank you. Glad. Always love hearing the atheists that, uh, that convert and uh, shout out to Seraphim because we've even got people, uh, that will be in the clergy soon that were former atheists. So it's amazing nice. to hear that concept. Yeah. Rolf stakes, 10 bucks. How is the church? Uh, I'll let uh, J uh, Jonathan answer this. How, how would you see the church as the body of Christ, but also the bride of Christ? I, I, I struggle to see how you find that difficult in the sense that that's actually, that's actually the, that's actually an, a very normal relationship. That is the, see, if you understand the body as this, let's say the capacity to kind of manifest in the world and to kind of have extensions and to have, that's what, uh, that's what happens when you, when you have children with a woman, it's like your body gets bigger, you could say. So the father is the head and then the family kind of extends out of the father and the, the, the woman becomes the, the, the vessel. She, she's the ark, she's the, the womb. And then, and then the fruits of that will kind of manifest in the world. And so that's why the body and the bride are completely related in terms of their, their symbolism. It's like heaven and earth, you know, it's that which is above that, which is below that, which is below, which takes the seed and then manifests it, it makes it fruitful and makes it appear as you know, as body. So. Oh yeah. Great answer. B Steph, $5. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the symbolic meaning? I think this is a joke or a troll comment. Do you have any thoughts on the symbolic meaning of the word Nicholas cage? Uh, since, <laughs> since Nicholas means victory of the people and a cage means confining structure. I think that's gotta be a joke, but that's actually pretty funny. Uh, Rolf stakes, $5. You guys should do a live stream on Rockfin to discuss symbolism and iconography in terms of, uh, the coof. Uh, we, we will definitely discuss that possibility since a lot of things on here, YouTube, you can't talk about. Yeah. Uh, also, perhaps you could discuss the uh, stabs and how that relates to the secular world, maybe like a secular sacrament could be. 
I think um, so. I think that's definitely something which is because there's this idea of sacrifice. It's presented to us as a sacrifice saying oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like you you have to it's like it's dangerous it, it is dangerous you you need to sacrifice yourself to participate in the in the community uh that's how it's presented and it's a uh, yeah and it's painful so it's a nice little image of kind of like circumcision or something like oh, that yeah. you know so all of this all of this makes it completely uh completely coherent in terms of a, a kind of secular sacrament exactly not scotty twenty dollars um Will the two of you discuss Patriarch Bar Bartholomew? Well, that's a controversial subject. I've done multiple podcasts, multiple interviews with uh, well-known public figures, Jim Jotras, Metropolitan Jonah. So you can go listen to those interviews to get my take on that. I don't know if Jonathan has a take or a position on P Patriarch Bartholomew. That's up to him. Yeah, I... I've kind of decided early on that that I although I don't think that church politics are unimportant, I think that that they're just not my my venue to speak about. And uh, and uh, so I try to concentrate on the things that I talk about. So I try to kind of avoid talking about the, you know, the sad politics of the of the Orthodox right. Church. John and non five dollars. What is the Orthodox perspective and symbolism concerning honoring your parents, elders, spiritual fathers and clergy? And how does. <laughs> disparaging uh boomers relate to the divine invert the divine order okay it's a joke i've been doing it's like a shtick i do i'm not literally disparaging boomers we have boomers come on the channel all the time many boomers i respect my godfather is a boomer right i love my godfather dean great guy metropolitan jonah we love him dr bradshaw so it's just a shtick i'm not literally intending to subvert the divine order but no um do you have any perspective on honoring father elder spiritual uh, uh authorities and how that relates to the divine order oh i mean it's definitely it's very important because one of the things that we have is especially a lot of it that come from protestantism we have this idea of this like pure relationship with god right it's like just me and god and i just need to honor god but that's not how it works we want the world to hold together that let's say there's a kind of a hierarchy of honor that we offer you know to to those that came before us to the saints to to our uh to our authorities to our fathers and that that doesn't take away from the worship we have of God. It actually becomes a way in which that kind of lays itself out in the world and holds reality together. Um, but in terms of making fun of boomers, I think that I think that there's that there's a sense in which we also have we also understand that the '60s were a real thing. Like the '60s really were a break. I mean, there were many breaks before, but that they really were a break, and that. In the same way that the hippies made fun of of the people who came before them, there's like a funny kind of double inversion in making fun of those that broke the system and showing how kind of cringy that that ends up looking. Mm. I think that it's it's kind of like Babylon B type humor where you know you're basically making fun of the person that's 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 supposed to make fun and then you you bring it back to just like normal normal order. So so I think that I kind of I totally get it and I think it's. You know, I, th I understand why it's part of, of Jay's stick, let's say. Say it that way. Well, by the way, I, oftentimes we invite people to make uh, the best uh, millennial and and uh, zennial. I, I think I'm on the cusp of millennial and, and, and zennial or whatever. I, whatever I'm on the cusp of, we, we invite people to bring those jokes as well. I don't mind it. I think it's actually <laughs> funny. There's yeah. plenty of things in my generation to make fun of. That's um, right. Woo D woo one dollar. How does pure act reduce or limit the omnipotence of God? I'm gonna let you answer that, Jay. <laughs> um, well, just simply, I would say that it's not really a, a, a limitation of omnipotence, it's more so a position that kind of confines God to only being able to do one thing at all times, and so. Uh, it would, it would, in the way that, for example, Thomistic theology conceives of pure act, omnipotence would literally be identical to pure act. So in that sense, it would limit, uh, the omnipotence. And so it would prevent things like God freely creating or God, the son incarnating, etc. Jared sends $5 and he says nothing. <laughs> Stoke it sends $10. Many of my students uh, from Mexico are wearing a St. Christopher necklace and icons on their shirt. That's weird. Why is there a resurgence in terms of devotion to St. Christopher? That I don't yeah. know. Yeah, well, I, I, I talk about that a lot, actually. I, I, I've, I really kind of 
talk quite a bit about St. Christopher as something like the patron saint of the end of the world, because St. Christopher is a, in both traditions. Like there's one tradition according to which he's a giant, he's a Canaanite. And there's another tradition according to which he's a, he's a dog-headed man, he's a cenocephaly. And so in that sense, St. Christopher is that image of hybridity on the edge, which is why he's the, he's the patron saint of travelers. He was represented on bridges, on these in, on these in between spaces, let's say, you know, connecting spaces between two identities. And so he's actually something of the craziness of the world right now. But it, that's why I emphasize St. Christopher, because he actually shows us the way that that can be flipped and transformed into carrying Christ. That is that the edge actually acts as a, a possibility of bringing Christ further, right? In the legend of St. Christopher, he ends up carrying Christ across the river. And so that, I think, that's one of the reasons why I think St. Christopher is important right now and is popular. Uh, and why, that's one of the reasons why I emphasize his imagery is to, is to balance out the negative aspect of the edge and to try to point towards something which is actually Christ carrying. Interesting. I didn't know anything about that. That's cool. Conrad, $3. Have you read Cosmos and Transcendence by Wolfgang Smith? This is a great conversation. I hope to see more in the future. If I have no, I, I haven't read much by Wolfgang Smith. Uh, I think Conrad is a, he's from our discord, so he knows yeah. I like that book. So yes, yeah. it is a good book. Uh, Hickory Dickory 86, 20 bucks. Uh, St. John tells us that 666 is the number of a man. Do you have any thoughts or opinions about Romanesque iconography, uh, John or Jay? I don't know. Um, and yes, he does say. Those are two questions, I imagine. I, like, I guess, I guess it. Uh, I, I think Romanesque iconography is wonderful. I think Romanesque means it's like it's like the Western mm -hmm. medieval style. I think it's I think it's wonderful. I think it's completely in line with Byzantine uh, tropes and Byzantine, let's say. Uh, so I think that for a Western version of Orthodoxy, I think that it's appropriate to kind of bring in some of that uh, Romanesque style. You see that in England, people like Aidan Hart and uh, many of the British iconographers are really doing it very deliberately. Uh, but but also very thoughtfully. Obviously, not just it's not just about copying, but it really is about kind of thoughtfully integrating <clears throat> kind of Western medieval uh, tropes into our iconography in order to, to to be able to celebrate that as well. J J Poopy again five dollars. Could it be argued symbolically that the Reformation uh, emphasis on the individual understanding of God's commands more closely follows the path in which Adam took rather than Jesus' emphasis on following the guidelines of hierarchy that he promised to leave us? Um, I think I kind of understand what you mean. I, I think that we I think that we really can understand the Reformation as a revolution. <clears throat> you know, it really, I always kind of say that you know, all the time that Luther was criticizing the church and was complaining about the excesses of the church, I'm there, I'm with you, Luther, like, I'm fine with you. But then the day that he named priests, I think that's the day when he went completely off his, off the rails. Like, he had no authority. He was a lay monk. He had no authority to name priests. He had no authority to, 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 to declare himself the authority in the church. And so I think that from that, from there, he just, I mean, then he started becoming completely mad in terms of uh, even in the way that he perceived the church and everything. Uh, and so I think that I think that it, it is appropriate to kind of understand the Reformation as a revolution and as even one of the earliest revolutions that led to the to the further revolutions that we see uh, the secular revolutions which came afterwards. I agree. I would say that uh, there is a move towards an atomized individual Christian and an individual Christianity, even if the classical reformers didn't intend that to be the case. That's kind of where the logic uh led so I, I think that is true devotional heart five dollars she says nothing thank you devotional heart victory five dollars can i make this happen now i've been having problems before testing it worked your five dollars <laughs> did come through and you did get it read so thank you for that j broad five dollars saint john damascus says the whole earth is a living icon of the face of god thank you for answering my last question i will read those books yes that's uh I think Jonathan was, was making that point earlier that the idea is that really the whole created order would be a, theophon, a theophanic manifestation. Fabio BR, $3. How do you react to clergy who feel threatened that some people would rather learn theology from you guys than from them? 
Uh, I'll let you answer that and then I'll give a response. Well, in my, I think in my case, I don't, I haven't had a issue with that in myself. Like I've had a, a problem, you know, mostly because when, especially when people ask me questions that become too personal or too much pastoral, I always tell them to go to the priest. Like I just say, go to your priest, go to church, you know? And so I, I've been, and also because I think that in a way, I also don't talk about theology that much. Like I try to avoid uh, the- theology. So I just haven't had, a, I just myself haven't had much of an issue with that. And I would say that, uh, you know, that has been uh, mentioned in regard to me in the Discord a few times. And I would say that, you know, we have clergy in the Discord. There's multiple priests, multiple multiple deacons, uh, and Metropolitan Jonah has done a year's worth of lectures in the Discord. So we always typically recommend that people do the very same thing because I don't want to be your spiritual father. I'm not a spiritual father. I'm not a guru. I'm more than happy uh, to, to tell people to go to their priest and their spiritual father. And and when people convert, we always tell them to find a canonical Orthodox church. So we're not trying to be any kind of gurus. Um, I don't see any more super chats. Uh, this has been a great discussion. Jonathan, is there anything you want to leave us with before we close out? No, I would say thanks. I think it was really, it was actually very, very productive and very, uh, it was a, it was a nice discussion and, and, uh, and yeah, so I'm looking, you know, we'll see. It'd be nice to, to, to do it again on, sure. on other subjects. And I, and I'm, and I'm really, it's like I'm really not surprised to what extent we we actually agree on on this image of how the world kind of how you know how the world lays itself out. I tend to not say it as theologically as you, but but um, I'm kind of happy to see that it connects with the way that that you talk about it in more kind of technically theological terms. I tend to have more informal way of talking about it, so I, I'm I'm happy that it turned out the way it did. Absolutely, yeah. Well, everybody, be sure and follow uh, Jonathan. His links are in the uh, show description. You see his channel there, and then you can go to his carvings page. And then I think I forgot the symbolic world link, but I'll put that in uh, after this. And uh, then you can follow him on uh, all of his socials as well. He's on Twitter. He's on, I think, you're on on Instagram too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you can follow him on all the socials. And uh, thank you, everybody. It was a, a great show. Be sure and like and share. And you can follow uh, and subscribe to my website as well. So thank you, Jonathan. It was a great chat. All right. Good night. All right. Bye-bye.